All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is December 16th, 2023. And as the title says, we're going to kind of clean up, or I shouldn't say clean up. This was a mind blower. We have understood these things for a while, but now to put it all together, to lay this all out from, from revelation, from understanding that that others with doctorates and so forth had had pieces of, but they couldn't fully understand. It is now clearly, clearly been revealed the understanding of Messiah Ben David, um, Ben Joseph, and Messiah Ben David. And as this title says, something along the lines of the coming for Messiahs. That is what today's video is going to be about. We are going to break down this timing because these coming for Messiahs that are in typologies and have played out in parts all throughout the was, the is, will all play out again in the is to come. And we're going to touch on um, just a couple little clips here and there on some of the same videos, plus a new one that they did that I had shared in the in the last one as well. Because it's so exciting, man. It's so awesome that that many others around the world that that are really diligent in these things but in particular this guest that they have he he really spent so much of his life digging into it and i would love to be able to reach him man i had my comments already deleted i said and i think in the last video but i would love to be able to reach to this guy and show him the rest of the picture because it's mind-blowing because we could show that messiah in all four messiah types he is going to fulfill in the end of days. And everything I'm going to show you, all of these tabs today, I've got no more space, are for today's video. We could even go beyond those. It's so it, There's so much. But we're just going to hit on some of these main points. And you'll see when we start how we're going to go about it. But we're going to show these main points. We're going to go into them. And what I want to say off the bat if anybody is new to this ministry coming across the video, you definitely don't want to start with this one. All right. You definitely don't want to start here. Where you want to start is in this playlist right here. This playlist right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note series. Watch the first four videos. You'll begin to understand where all of the opening of the books, where all of the revelation here when it began a little over six years ago. It all started with the revelation of the differences in the Gospels, who they're speaking to. Then it revealed that when you realize that the Gospels in the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the end is Luke, Mark, and Matthew, you're going to say, oh my goodness, that makes sense why the discourses are so different. Why there's so much more in Matthew because it goes to 25. Why there's so little in Luke's and it's different than Mark and Matthew completely. It will all start to make sense. And you'll see things like these differences within the Gospels. You'll see that Jesus going to the cross in Luke was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. You'll see in Mark, he was arrayed in purple. And wait until I share that one with you. We've got more insight on that one tonight, brothers and sisters. And the third one is when you go to Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. Well, we know white, radiant, beautiful, gorgeous is a bride's gown. We know purple and scarlet. Just go read Revelation 17. Purple and scarlet are tribulation colors. That's because Mark's group is the left behind that will be part of the mid-trib great multitude rapture. Matthew's is the left behind house of Judah, which is going to be at the end post-trib. Luke's is pre, Mark's is mid, Matthew is post. It's the spirit filled in Christ going first, watching and praying. It is the mid trib, great multitude rapture, those who are left behind, the world, the house of Israel, grafted in with them, uh, the Gentiles, grafted in with the house of Israel, which is called the world. Theirs is mid trib, great multitude rapture. And Judah's is to the house of Judah, which is the gospel of Matthew, and their portion is trumpets. When you start to see that in the first intro video within this, it will then cause you to say, well, how is all this in seven years? The answer is it's not. It's 14 years. The other place you can go to see this 
is here on our website at ministryrevealed.com. You can come over here, click on the menu, and go to the intro page. You'll hear me sometimes talking about the forum where people are sharing. They're sharing. There's news. There's events. There's Bible studies. You can come and join us in the forum there. About 1,200 people around the world, and they're sharing all sorts of things. And it's free. It takes you a few seconds. Then here's that same four-video intro. This intro is 22 minutes, and it introduces the next three and, and touches on what they'll talk about. This is the one I was telling you who the Gospels are speaking to. It's a 30-minute introduction only to get you understanding some of it. Then the 14-year tribulation, which is revealed after you understand the differences in the Gospels, it's going to blow your mind. It's a picture all the way back to creation. It's really incredible. Then the fourth video, <coughs> excuse me, it's all because of Matthew, is a big video. It's about uh, two hours, 45 minutes, and this is like the icing on the cake. After you've watched those other ones and you get to this, you're going to say, how on earth did all of this get missed? One is because it wasn't yet God's timing. And two is because we've all been taught foundationally from the gospel of Matthew. And we were only told to look to Mark and to look to Luke of the synoptic gospels to look at them as little fill in the gaps. Well, it's a way thousand times way more than that. So those are the first four videos. Then you can go deeper. This is like a three-hour study on the differences of the Gospels. This will reveal to you the discourses in order, Luke, Mark, Matthew. It'll blow your mind. You'll see that pre, mid, and post are all true, and you could see them in typologies in the triumphal entry, the transfiguration, and the resurrection stories of the synoptic Gospels of Luke, Mark, Matthew. They're all prophetic pictures built within them. And today, and so, so much more. And today, as we go into these things, you're going to see. So those who have been around for a while, of course, we're going to cover many of the same things that we've covered before to, to tie this all together of where, at what point throughout the 14 years and the 50 days that come first, where is he, these four messiahs throughout the end of days? But hold on tight. Because we're going to connect more things for you today as well. Like I told you about the color purple. And after that, or and along the way, we're going to connect something that many people, you know, it, it's so crazy. We show the revelation of 14 years from about 50 different places in scripture. It's, it's craziness. And the one place everybody tries to say, Oh, well, it's 14 years, sure. But just go to Joseph. It was seven easy, and then it was seven hard. So we're in the seven easy, and then it's still really just seven years of tribulation. No. you They still haven't understood properly, really dug into what it is saying in that story in, in Genesis 41 about the seven easy and the seven difficult. Well, when you go, when we go into this today, when we get to that part in connecting these different timings of Messiah, it's also going to bring us to chapters to years. So anybody that's new to the ministry and you're hearing chapters to years, we've been able to reveal these books, open these books where we have found within their chapters, verses, sometimes the entire chapter that is talking about prophetic revelation to the end, that is directly connected to events that happen within the years of the end of days, meaning within the first year seal, second year, third, fourth, fifth, and so forth, within all of these chapters. Now, what happens, and here's another important thing, is many people will say, well, does that mean one seal opens up in the first year, second seal in the second year, third? No. This is just telling you year one, two, three, four, five, six, and the seventh year of seals, because it's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. It doesn't mean one seal per year. In fact, the first seal happens in the 50 days, which we're going to cover uh, a little bit later. So when you see these things, I promise you, it's going to blow your mind. And you'll find these connections um, everywhere with the 14 years. But now in relation to the, the year count, we've changed this year after year after year. 
We had reasons to believe it with specific years in the past, but it doesn't change the revelation of these chapters. It just means at the moment of the pre-trib escape, you now know. So this 50 days in the final seven, which we're in a seven-year Shemitah right now, this final 50 days will take place in 2024. I believe the 50 days before Feast of Trumpets of 2024. It might be sooner, but in that time frame. And then you will have it all begin. Whether it's 2024, whether it's 2032, whether it's 2060, this will not change. It's just simply a matter of once it begins. Then you could fill in those dates of years from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets, and your insight is all laid out within these. Now, if um, you haven't, so if you've been around for a little while and you haven't yet watched uh, the last video, this one here, I would highly, highly, highly recommend you watch this video before continuing with today's video. Because this one was, it sealed the deal. I mean, the revelation we knew, this now completed the storyline. We know when Yeshua is coming as Messiah ben Joseph. We know what he's going to fulfill as Messiah ben Joseph. He is Messiah ben Joseph or son of Ephraim. It's the same thing. You will understand it more clearly than you ever have before, even from the other revelations that we had put together, revealing the entire understanding. So with that, let's get this party started. We're going to start right here. This one, we're just going to listen to a few seconds just to, to remind you guys that there's always been a prophetic understanding of four Messiah types. But something that they haven't understood, <clears throat> excuse me, is that two of them are the same one. You'll see what, I, what I'm talking about when we get there. But let's have a listen to what they call, and this is the uh, Scottish or Irish. I know they don't like uh, <laughs> mix up, but he's one of them. And he's talking to one for Israel. And we're just going to share, I'm just going to share this one clip to get it going. And then we're going to go into what the scriptures tell us about him fulfilling the first one. And then we have Jesus who fulfills the role of king and sacrifice and priest, priest. and prophet. So this is there. Do you hear that? That he will fulfill, uh, um, what was it, uh, king, priest, sacrifice, and prophet. What he doesn't really know is that he's kind of got them exactly in the reversed order. Because what's going to happen is we know that Messiah is coming as prophet first. And then he's coming as, uh, as priest. He's coming as high priest and sacrifice. Because when he comes as the high priest, he is coming as the high priest sacrifice. We've talked about that. It was in the last one, but we're going to lay that out in where this all plays out. But he has to come as the high priest to become that sacrifice. You see, when Jesus came the first time, these things were simply spiritual. Yes, he died on the cross. Yes, he was the sacrificial lamb for all of our sins. He, he, he took upon the sins of the world. He's not dying again for the sins of the world. He's doing it for somebody specific, a specific group of people. That's what's happening. And even these guys, it... it it boggles my mind. Uh, I shouldn't say it boggles my mind. I mean, I get it because it just, it's almost like their mind, even if their mind might be able to see it, it won't let them, it won't let them go there if it's even come to their thoughts. And the reason I say it, as many of you guys know, is because when we go to Leviticus chapter one, we know that the atoning bull offering sacrifice has not yet been fulfilled. So it's like everything. It's like going Matthew, Mar uh, Mark, and Luke. So when Jesus was born, as we've shared, there were two turtle doves that were sacrificed for him. Jesus' death and resurrection, when he died for the sins of the world, 
he was the the lamb without blemish. So when they're talking about a bull and they're talking about Messiah ben Joseph and they're talking about the its connection to him being Messiah ben Joseph or Messiah ben Eve or, or Messiah Ephraim, they're, they're, they know that this connection is to the bull. But a bull and a lamb are not the same. We know Jesus hasn't fulfilled this yet. So why does he have to fulfill this? For the priestly line, Aaron and his sons. That's why he's going to be the greater priest than Aaron. He's going to be the Melchizedek. And so fitting to where we see it, as I said, where not only are we going to see these connections and, and more great revelation in the differences in the Gospels, we're going to see the chapters to years play into it. All of this stuff is going to be tied in throughout the entire video of these things that we've been revealing since the very beginning, where he's going to be prophet, high priest, sacrifice, and king, all in order, relating to a pre, a mid, and a post, always, always, always in threes. So now, let's see what we find here when we're talking about what he said last. So he said king, priest, sacrifice, and prophet. Well, we know first he's going to be prophet, then he's going to be the priestly sacrifice, and then he's going to be king, which means when he came the first time, he was a prophetic picture of David. When he comes in the midst of tribulation, he is coming as Messiah ben Joseph. And when he returns, he's coming as Messiah ben David king. So you have David and Matthew, you have David and Luke being represented. Well, isn't that interesting? Because the one in the middle that doesn't mention it is, of course, Mark. And who did Jesus come to save but the lost sheep of the house of Israel? The lost sheep of the house of Israel is not the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ are those in Christ, spirit-filled, going pre-trip. The ones who are left during seals that will take part in the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. They are the ones he's coming to save. You see, that's who he's coming for. And then there's the dealing with the portion of Judah. It's so incredible to understand. So let's start with prophet. Okay, let's go to prophet. It's so much fun. So what do we know about this prophet? Well, let me show you this. It's, it's one of those differences in the Gospels. As I said, we're going to cover a lot of things that cover the differences within the Gospels, and we're going to bring more of them to light today as well. So one of the biggest things we've shared many times over the years is that these differences in the Gospels, and especially the one when it comes to Jonah, is so vastly different in Luke, Mark, and Matthew that it is clearly a quote-unquote discrepancy and causes people to say, ah, you see? Man-made, man-written. They don't understand the divine revelation within it. And we're given all sorts of reasons and explanations why. But the truth is, it's all prophecy. It is all in there for prophecy. And we've been proving it for six years. And this is a great one when it comes to the story of Jonah. So what do we know about Jonah? In Luke 21, in verse 39, halfway through, um, this is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonah, the prophet, the prophet. For as Jonah was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall the Son of Man be to this generation. When you see this in, in the New Testament, it's talking about the final generation. It is prophetic because Jesus never fulfilled the sign of Jonah. Everybody, the church will tell you he fulfilled it in his resurrection for 40 days. No, he didn't. 
No, he didn't. He did not go around warning for 40 days of the impending destruction coming upon Jerusalem and everything that would take place. These are things that he spoke while he was there, not during his 40 days. This has not yet been fulfilled. This is a prophetic picture of Jesus coming as prophet as Jonah was during what we call the 40 days of the Son of Man. They have not been fulfilled yet. These 40 days of the Son of Man will happen in the midst of these 50 days right here. Okay? In the midst of those 50 days is when it happens. Let me show you some more information about it. In Luke chapter 17, we get more details. In Luke chapter 17, he says, uh, For as lightning that lighteth out of one part of heaven unto the other part, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. Okay? Not days, day. Because this is talking about when he comes as lightning from one end unto the other in his day, which is when he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives. You can say like the end of the sixth year of trumpets, which is the end of the 13th year or the start of the 14th year. That's when he comes as lightning from one end unto the other, which why you see it in certain places like in Matthew 24 at the coming of the Lord. When you see it in Matthew 28, because his resurrection is a prophetic picture of his return feet down in Matthew 28, whereas Mark, it's the end of the six years of seals. Matthew, uh, Luke is the, the start of his 40 days after the escape. I mean, it's, it's so incredible once you see it. But now listen to what it says. So he's telling them what it's going to be like at his last day when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives. And then he says in Luke 20, uh, 17, 25, but first, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. There it is again. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days. You see, now he's gone plural. In the days of the Son of Man. So he's talking about the 40 days of Noah here. So we've got more insight into the 40 days. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered in the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So we've got this but first, and he references to us the 40 days of Noah that came next when they all got into the ark. That is very important to understand because we know what this is going to relate to. If we go, of course, to Genesis chapter 7, we know this storyline. What do we see? We've, we see many things, and we've broken this down many times over the years. There's actually two prophetic pictures in the story of Genesis 7 and 8 in relation to Noah. It is a prophetic picture. Yes, it is a prophetic picture of Matthew chapter 24, which is the final year after the Lord's return, feet down on the Mount of Olives. He is going to fulfill a typology of Genesis in the final year, the 14th year, the seventh year of trumpets, the 14th year of tribulation, when he returns feet down. That's why he's telling you that in Matthew's discourse, but not in Mark's and not in Luke's. However, there is another prophetic picture in the story of the ark from Genesis 7 into 8. And this story <laughs> excuse me, is an overall big picture of the 50 days and the 14 years. Let me show you that briefly. Listen to what it says. And it came to, oh, where is it? Uh, too far down. For yet seven days. And then it says, and it came to pass after seven days. So what does that mean? Well, for those of you who are newer, when we're talking about these 50 days that come first, the way it breaks down is the bride, the pre-trib Gentile bride is taken right at the beginning, right at the beginning of the 50 days. And then it says for yet seven days in the prophetic picture and then says, and it came to pass after seven days because during those first seven days of the 50 days, the seven day wedding is taking place. The Gentile wedding 
is taking place in the third heaven with the pre-trib group. And what happens after seven days, which means what? The eighth day. When the Lord returns after seven days on the eighth day, that is when he begins his 40 days. And this is exactly what we see right here in Genesis 17, uh, 7, 17. And the flood was 40 days. This is the prophetic picture of what he's telling us in Luke 17 about his 40 days. It's the same building on the typology of what he said that he would be as Jonah was, which is the prophet for 40 days as Jonah was. And then what do we see? <coughs> Excuse me. We go to Genesis chapter 8. And in the big picture storyline, we then see, and the 40 days come to an end. So you had seven days, then you had the 40 days starting on the eighth day. When the 40 days are over, you have how many days left to 50? You have three days. So Messiah has now completed his 40 days. He now leaves. Okay, well, there's, there's other things that he does while he's here, but we're not going into all that. It's to show his 40 days as prophet that come first. And when he comes for these 40 days and does all these things, he leaves at the end of 40 days. There are three days left, not many, right? Like Revel uh, like uh, Acts chapter 1. And what happens? The raven spirit is sent out. Okay, the raven. What does raven mean? It means Arab, the dusky hue, the, the darker color complexion of the skin. It means Arab. So the, the Arab, that, that antichrist spirit goes out. What does it all e also equal? The red horse rider. OK, the red horse rider, the sword of Revelation, chapter six, the sword is given. So how many days do we have left at this point to the dove? Three. The raven goes out first. And then what do we know happens on the 50th day? It's Pentecost. The dove is given out. So the dove will anoint these people that were with the son of man for 40 days being revealed greater understanding. And then they receive the anointing of what we call Acts 2.0. And when this happens, they go out then from Jerusalem in the same typology of Acts chapter 2. And what happens? The dove goes back into the ark, goes back into heaven. And look at what it says. And he stayed seven days. These seven days are a prophetic typology of years. We've shared on this in the past as well. Many others have as well from Perry Stone and a whole bunch of others. Anybody that studies prophecy knows that there are prophetic typologies where days can be years, years can be days, and so forth. And we've revealed this one very clearly over the years. So the dove is now gone for seven days or seven years. And look at the word stayed as a little side note. Tribulation. 14 years, the tribulation begins at the beginning of the first seven days, which is 14 years. So now when these seven days or years go by, then what do you see? The dove is sent out again, and in its mouth is an olive leaf plucked off. What's this olive leaf? Plucked. What's the word for rapture, harpazo? It means plucked. So what's happening? Seven days of seven years, great multitude rapture in the seventh year. Then the dove is gone again. And then it's gone for seven more days or seven more years. And look at this word stayed. It's what you think it should be, which means if you don't have a, a Strong's Concordance or a, a program like this called ESORD, you would have never understood that stayed and stayed are not the same words. Stayed starts tribulation at the start of the 14. The second seven, it actually means wait. So you had seven years of seals, great multitude rapture, seven years of trumpets. And then when the dove goes out, it doesn't return again anymore. 14 years comes to an end, and it's the prophetic picture of, of the 50 days and the 14 years. And it's also the prophetic picture where that entire storyline is one year and 10 days. And when it's all over, lo and behold, it's the end of the 14th year of tribulation which is the 14th year also where the Lord said he would be 
uh, uh, in Matthew 24 when he returns and he says it would be as it was in the days of Noah. You see how crazy it is? I love putting out these stories. We've talked on these many times, but I just love it. So, but the key we're talking about here are these 40 days. These are the same 40 days, as I said, from Luke 17 that he was telling us. They're the same 40 days in the same typology that he would warn, as he said, Jonah did. They're all the same timing. We've shared on this. This was awesome when we came across this a while back, like a few years ago. In the Muslim eschatology, they have a guy called Dajjal. They believe Dajjal is going to is going to be like Christ and he's going to he's going to claim to be Christ and he's going to do these signs and these wonders. He's going to do incredible miracles, uh, bring cattle back. He's going to stop the sun, do all these things. And they believe that he is the Christian Antichrist. We know he is not the Christian Antichrist, but he is literally the son of man coming as prophet as Jonah did for the 40 days as Noah. And what does their prophecy tell them? That when this guy appears, who they think they call the Christian Antichrist, he's coming for 40 days. For 40 days. And they call him the Christian's Antichrist. Corresponding with the Antichrist in Christian tradition. It's not true because the Antichrist doesn't come for 40 days. Could you imagine how, how, how sad it will be? When people realize that it was the Son of Man here for 40 days, man, there'll be a bunch of people with them, remnant workers from the bride chosen to remain to stay. They're going to be with them, following them, getting instruction and understanding. Then they'll receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and they will start to work during the tribulation. But people will be blinded because the church never understood that the Son of Man is coming after the Gentile wedding. Now, what else do we get? Well, watch this in Luke chapter nine. So let's now show. So we've been, we've showed a couple of these points now to show that he's here for 40 days. <coughs> we know these pictures of days that can be as years, years as days. Well, <clears throat> we also know that he's coming on the eighth day, right? So sometime about an eight days, he's coming after the wedding. And we've shown why the picture in Luke chapter 21 of the transfiguration, as I shared with you guys in the in the um, intro series, when you get the understanding a little bit and then you go further into it, you see that the transfiguration story in Luke and Mark and Matthew are different. And in relation to Luke's, only Luke's says it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. When you go to Mark, it says after six days. You go to Matthew, it says after six days. This is another clear contradiction that can't simply be explained away. And what you realize is just like those stories with, jo with Noah and the days being a picture of years. Well, they're a picture of days, but they're also a picture of years. This is playing a dual role, saying it's about, it, it's, it's just about... The eighth year, so seven years where the bride is being prepared, seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets. So after these first seven years, the eighth day or the eighth year is just about ready to start when he comes to begin his 40 days. So it's about an eighth year, but it goes beyond that because it's also about an eighth day. <laughs> Excuse me. Because the transfiguration story is also a prophetic picture of him coming to begin his 40 days as the son of man prophet. Okay? We've shared this. If you go back and you go into Mark and you go into Matthew, you see after six days, it's after the six years of seals. When you go to Matthew, it's after the six years of trumpets. And the wording that follows after them is equally as incredible for example <clears throat> in mark maybe i'll save mark for a little bit later but you'll see what happens in mark 
which is after six days or a prophetic picture of after six years, we've shown why Elijah is suddenly mentioned and he already restored everything because it was happening during seals. Okay, by the end of seals, he's restored everything and Jesus is coming on heavenly Mount Zion. He has restored everything and now he's taking the great multitude rapture in the seventh year. You go to Matthew and in Matthew 17, this gets incredible. Because in Matthew 17, it says after six days, which is after six years of trumpets, which is the picture of him coming feet down on the Mount of Olives, like Luke 17 in the first portion, when he comes in his day, it's like Matthew 24, when he's come in Matthew 24 on the clouds, and it would be as the days of Noah. So now he's coming to fulfill that final year as Noah. But what happens at that point? Well, you have an incredible piece of scripture only in Matthew's, in, in Matthew's um, uh, uh, transfiguration story where it says that Jesus rises again from the dead. All right, when the sun, until the son of man be risen again from the dead. We're going to talk on that though a little bit later after we go through this because you're going to see these things that these guys are saying in, in what this guy studied and what he has put together over his years of showing and understanding the revelation of Messiah ben Joseph, <clears throat> you'll understand why it says that. And so this, this gets really exciting too, because in 927, but I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. And then what does Luke say? And it came to pass about in eight days after these sayings. <clears throat> so after these sayings, meaning a group of people that did not taste of death, but the next thing they saw was the kingdom of God. That's the pre-trib group going to the wedding. And he's returning about an eight days later. And we have this prophetic picture of what takes place when he comes to begin his 40 days on the eighth day. Where else do we see it? Well, let's go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20 is very interesting because in the chapters to years, the gospel of John in his 21 chapters is very powerful. And it lines up with Genesis chapter 21 chapters, the first 21, in their prophetic pictures of events that are taking place in it. Like, in, for example, in John 14, we see Jesus says that um, he's going to prepare a place, and when he returns, he will receive you unto himself, that where he is, there may be also, right? He's going to prepare a mansion. In my father's house are many mansions. And this is when he comes to get the great multitude rapture to bring them to their mansions. When you go to Genesis 14, you see the first mention of Melchizedek. It's fascinating. Why? Because when he comes as high priest Melchizedek, he is coming as the priestly lineage. But who is that priestly lineage? Joshua. And Joshua, of course, is a descendant of Joseph. So he's coming as high priest. And what has to happen to the bull? The sacrifice. And wouldn't you know it? Hebrews chapter 7 is talking about Melchizedek as well. And one that can't be from Judah. Jesus is from Judah. Clearly, Messiah, our Lord, is from the house of Judah, from the tribe of Judah. Yet, it is more evident that a greater king has to come. It's so powerful. So look at what we see in John chapter 20. Now, here's the thing. You might look at this in the chapters of years, and you're saying, well, why would this be a prophetic picture in relation to, like I said, so what you're going to see is this prophetic picture as if it's the very end of the 20th year, uh, chapter 20. It's like the end of the 13th year, right at the very end of the 13th year of trumpets. But what is it also? Well, for those that have been following, it's also a prophetic picture of the beginning of the 50 days. So from the was going into the is, you have Jesus' death and resurrection, and the story plays out in John chapter 20. And after he meets with the apostles, he then goes to the Luke group, and he meets with the Luke group, 
And what does he do with them? Those two on the road to Emmaus, he's with them for what? 40 days. That's right, 40 days. Was, is, and is to come. Old Testament to Christ is the was, Christ until the pre-trib is the is, and the is to come is from the pre-trib to the end. It all repeats. And so look at what we had in John chapter 20. We see in John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene, she is a prophetic type, if you will, of the bride. You've probably even heard in churches, like in Catholic in doctrine, that Mary, uh, some believe that Mary Magdalene was Jesus' wife. Well, it, we've done a video on this, and it's fantastically interesting, not because she was his wife, but because she's a prophetic picture of his wife. Her name, Magdalene, means tower. And when you go to the definition of tower, which is the Hebrew 4026, do you know where the bed of flowers and breasts like towers comes from? You got it. It's the Song of Solomon and his declaration for his beautiful bride. Fascinating, isn't it? So she plays a prophetic picture of the bride. So, boom, the beginning of the 50 days, the Lord is there. He says, but you can't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to my father. You see? So what's happening? It's almost like what we're seeing here is something we've talked about in Luke quite a bit. And we'll touch on in a moment where he's pre-warning his remnant bride, that remnant workers who are staying. He's telling them he's about to take away the bride. He's about to go to the wedding. And look what happens. I have not yet ascended. She can't touch him. Go and tell my disciples. And then what happens? Then that would be a prophetic picture. At this point, bang, the pre-trib happens. The pre-trib happens. He then ascends after this encounter right here. And what happens? It's a prophetic picture, like a taking of the bride. And then he comes back again the same day at evening. So he's taken the bride now. And he comes back the same day at evening, as we've said before, right on the escape day. Same day at evening on the pre-trib day. He comes back and he anoints the apostles who are going to have this incredible infilling of the Holy Ghost now that the bride is gone. You see, there has to be this Holy Ghost power still on the earth. And these guys, the modern day apostles, will have it. And then what happens? He leaves. Now Jesus is gone. So we got this prophetic picture and he comes back, what? After eight days again. Here he is now coming eight days again. So we have this prophetic picture where, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to my father. It's like he's forewarning this group that we talk about in Luke. Then he ascends. That's the pre-trib being taken. Then he comes back on the same day at evening. He anoints the apostles and he's gone again. He's gone now to the wedding. He's gone to the seven-day wedding and he'll return on the eighth day. When he returns on the eighth day, he will meet with the apostles again briefly, for which now the twelfth will be there, Thomas. And then what do we know? Of course, it takes us to Luke 24. Now he's going to meet with the Luke group, the two on the road to Emmaus for 40 days. We know that he's going to open unto them their understanding. We know that he is going to serve them and eat with them because he said he would have a banquet with this group before he left for the wedding. And we know this because if we follow the story, because Luke goes into Acts, when we get to Acts chapter 21, we know these two that were with them stayed with them for, of course, 40 days. Speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So the pre-trib group went to the kingdom of God. They went to the third heaven portion in the inner part of the kingdom of God. And the great multitude rapture, when that happens in the seventh year of seals, they're going to the paradise portion of the kingdom of God. And here we have what, the seven days? So after seven is the eighth day. That started the 40 days. And then you have not many days hence. It leaves about three days to Acts chapter two and the anointing that comes at true Pentecost with the Holy Ghost. So again, we have this eight days. So we see this prophetic picture of John, how John 
at the at this at the resurrection at, at the start of this entire story it's a prophetic picture of how it all begins again because there is a gentile wedding there's a 50 day period of time there's a gentile wedding there's a group that was told that he's taking a group to the wedding he's taking them to the wedding but to be ready when he returns and he'll serve them we know that they follow him for 40 days we know that there is a prophetic picture of the end of days of 40 40 days of the son of man and so does the enemy's prophetic words, even though they think he's there and he is the Antichrist. We know he's not. So we can show these things all hidden in these prophetic mysteries that indeed the Son of Man is 100% coming for 40 days as he said he would, as Jonah did. So let's go look here in Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12 is where we see him telling them what I was talking about earlier. He tells them, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves that uh, that wait for the Lord when you'll return from the wedding. We've shared this many, many times. It is incredible. This is a prophetically chosen group of people being prepared to work for the Lord, to serve him during the end of days. They're, they're among the Gentile bride being prepared, spirit-filled in Christ, watching and praying. But they're going to be told in advance, shortly in advance, like we saw in Luke chapter 20, uh, in John chapter 20. They're going to be prophetically prepared in advance. And right before the pre-trib happens, he's going to let them know. And when he went, lets them know, they're going to be ready. They're going to be girded about. They're going to be ready for his return when he comes from the wedding. And when he comes back from the wedding, we saw that he meets with the apostles and then he comes to meet with these guys. They're, they're the prophetic picture on the two on the road to Emmaus, but it'll be far more than two. We've talked about it before. And these are the guys that are going to follow him. These men and women, they're going to follow him for the 40 days. And these guys are the ones that we just read about in Luke chapter 24. And this is why you see the difference, such a big difference in Luke's resurrection story than you see over in Mark and Matthew's because he opens unto them the understanding. You see, he tells them there are things about him that are yet to be fulfilled, that are written in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms concerning him. And he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. You don't read this in Mark. You don't read this in Matthew. It's prophetically different storylines on purpose. Yes, there were things that happened in those days, and they do tie the Gospels together. But there are also clear differences that are prophetic and different storylines that are written purposely for the prophetic. So this is that group following him while he's doing these things for 40 days. He's going to have a meal with them. They're going to follow him for 40 days. He's going to open to them their understanding. And when he leaves, not many days hence, then they receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost. So when he leaves, as we saw in Luke chapter in Luke cha uh, Acts chapter one, and it said not many days hence, that's the picture we saw in the story of the ark when the forty days were over. Then the raven went out. That raven spirit, that Arab spirit, that goes out. That's when it starts, and then you have the three days later with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. So, <clears throat> so what is the period of this wedding what's taking place during these seven days well we've shared on this before the seven days first off there's something happening in the heavens right in the third heaven which is the gentile wedding what is that picture in the, the gentile wedding well it's something we've shared that was so mind-blowingly incredible and now proven to us of the pre mid and post in the story of the three feasts of the Lord and that Leah and Rachel are a prophetic picture of the pre-trib and the mid-trib groups. Leah was taken before Rachel to be his bride, right? And Jacob in Genesis 29 is all upset because he was duped by his father-in-law to which his father-in-law says, look, I didn't dupe you. In our custom, you can't have the younger 
before the older. You see? The older Leah was before the younger Rachel. And when you understand that there are two wheat harvests that take place on the earth without going into everything, you realize that Leah is the winter wheat, which is called old wheat. Even now, winter wheat is called old wheat, not because it's bad, but because it was planted and it's in the ground sooner, right? Uh, way earlier, it's in late fall. It takes root before during winter, and then it grows during spring and it's harvested in midish summer. And it could be used right away. Leah is the prophetic picture of winter wheat, which are the two loaves baked with leaven. Rachel, on the other hand, is the younger, which is called spring wheat. Spring wheat is the younger wheat. It's planted in the spring. It's harvested in, in fall, right? Very late summer to early fall. It's harvested then, but it cannot be used till the following year on the second day of Passover, the second day of unleavened bread. That is the mid-trib great multitude rapture. So what is this Leah picture when we're talking about the wedding? Well, it just so happened that Jacob worked how long to get Leah? He worked seven years. And he said that those seven years flew by like days. What are those seven years? They're the seven, quote unquote, what I call easy years. Doesn't mean everybody's life was easy, but compared to the seven and seven that are coming, they're easy. All right. And then what does he say? Even though they were seven years, they flew by like days. Well, how about that? Because the real connection to the end of days begins at the start of 50 days. So they were seven years, but they flew by. They felt like days. Beautiful, right? Then he serves what? Seven more years for Rachel. And then he serves six more years for the cattle. And what happens? It's a prophetic picture of 20 years in the big picture or the end of the 13 years of tribulation. Beautiful, right? Incredible, incredible stuff. So what are we seeing? We are seeing that this is what? The Leah wedding. Fulfill her week. And I will give you also the, the service for which you will do seven more years. And Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. It was a seven-day wedding. When? Seven years that flew by then like days. So you've got this prophetic picture of seven, then seven, then six to the very end, which, of course, is then the Lord returning feet down. Where's the wedding? Right there. Right at the beginning of the 50 days, connected to the end of seven years, which is the typology of the story of Leah. You see, it's in the old, it's in the new, it's all over the place. So now, what is it that we can see that Christ is doing during those 40 days as the Son of Man? Well, if we go to Luke chapter 21, remember in Luke 17, it said that, there we go. In Luke 17, he said that, um, uh, uh, um, but first or but before all these things, right? Listen to what he says in chapter 21 of Luke. So in, in chapter 17, he said, but first, right? Must he suffer? Must he do all these things? <clears throat> Which related to the 40 days. In Luke 21, 12, look at what we read. But before all these. So what are we seeing? He's telling them, and this is Luke's words where he jumps in, like Jesus is saying this is to Matthew and to Mark. Then he said unto them, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes and famines and pestilence and all these things, right? This, is, this isn't happening yet in Luke's discourse. Because Luke's discourse pertains to those 40 days after the escape, the wedding, he's coming for 40 days. Where do the 40 days start? Right here. So he's telling you, before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, he there's something that takes place, but before, to which he said he would be here, but first, for 40 days as Jonah was. So now he's here for 40 days. He told us in Luke 21, he referred it to us in Genesis. We know it's the typology of him being as Jonah. This is now to the group of people that are with him 
that are following him during the 40 days and that will remain afterwards to continue during seals. And look at what it says. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up into synagogues and into prisons and brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. It shall turn to you for a testimony settled therefore in your hearts, uh, not to meditate before what you shall answer, for I will give you a mouth in wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist. And you shall be, be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends. And some of you, they shall cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. In your patience, possess you your souls. So this is all taking place during this period of 40 days. And it will continue for these guys during seals because they are going about after they receive the anointing. They're going out into the world after Acts 2.0 to preach and to teach and to do all those things in the remission of sins during the time of seals. Could you imagine the craziness after the pre-trib, after tens of millions of people have vanished and chaos started breaking out on the earth? Wild, right? And then you've got the son of man here with a group of, of people following him who, who understand who he is and what's taking place and that it's really him, the creator, is here on the earth as the son of man, as the prophet. And the world is in chaos. I can't even imagine what it will even begin to look like when it all starts, let alone by the time it gets to mid-seals and mid-trumpets. So now what does Jesus tell us that he's going to do? Ah, remember, he said he would warn as Jonah did. He never fulfilled that yet. This is where it starts in Luke 21, 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed by armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh and let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and not and and let not them that are in the countries enter here into enter there into for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled bang why because when that attack and destruction begins on Jerusalem it starts the 14 years the beginning of vengeance of all things which are written may be fulfilled. You see? It goes into the distress. They shall fall by the edge of the sword, be led away captive into all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, which is the end of seals. See that? Incredible, incredible, incredible stuff. That is what he's doing during the 40 days. He's warned us. He's shown it to us everywhere. In fact, let me show you another one. This is a great tie-in because when not only in the tie-in show for another picture of the Son of Man for 40 days, but it's a great tie-in because, as I said earlier, the triumphal entry is another prophetic picture of him coming to begin his 40 days. It's a picture of him coming at the end of seals. It's a picture of him coming at the end of trumpets. In Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Well, look at what the triumphal entry in Luke says. I want you to pay close attention to something. Look at 19, verse 38, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Okay? Interesting, right? I just want you to keep that in the back of your mind. But now listen to this. Here he comes. So now this is the prophetic picture in the typology of him coming to begin his 40 days that started the triumphal entry. And look at what he does. Do you realize that this story where, that's called when Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, this story is only in Luke's, not in Mark's, not in Matthew's. And what does it say? And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it saying, if thou hadst known, even now, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come unto thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and they shall compass thee round about and keep thee in on every side. Sound familiar? It's the same thing he was warning about in Luke 21, which is the prophetic discourse of what's coming. When he's here for 40 days, when he's fulfilling Jonah as the 40 days of Noah. 
and they shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Awesome, right? Awesome. This is prophetic as well. Clearly prophetic, directly connected in to Luke chapter 21. What is this portion? Well, we've also explained, this is one of my newer favorite ones over the years. Um, you know, I say newer favorite ones, man. There's been so many awesome ones. But here's another one that we've shared on many times. And that is Isaiah chapter 9. We know that the first attack is going to happen in northern Israel. So this is what I was saying. When I, when I mentioned earlier that what is happening during the first seven days of those 50 before he returns as the son of man, not only in heaven, in the third heaven, is there the Gentile wedding taking place, but on the earth, there's obvious chaos. Tens of millions of people have vanished. A stone's throw. We know there's, we know there's some sort of meteor coming during this week as well well what else is happening we know that two northern cities in israel i believe that are connected to haifa and tel aviv are going to be attacked and destroyed there will be a short middle east war probably lasting a week that will break out in the middle east until what well it'll probably relatively settle on its own because of all the chaos going on around the earth and if Haifa and Tel Aviv are destroyed, you can imagine some of the things that might happen to Iran that will bring the attack. So it'll be short-lived. It'll be very devastating, but it won't last very long. I believe it's only going to last a week. And look who comes after that week. Of course, the Son of Man. For unto us a child is born. And we were told, as we've shared on this in the past, we're told from Matthew chapter 4, that when Jesus, quote unquote, fulfilled this in the it, excuse me, in the is that he fulfilled it and it was fulfilled at the time that John was taken into prison. And we know John wasn't put into prison for about two months after Jesus had come up on the scene. So this was very prophetic for us because it revealed to us that Jesus being born at the true feast of weeks in the third month or or being born at the third month, 15th day, 16th day, that it's not where the tribulation would actually begin, where the 50 days would begin and him coming to start his 40 days. So because if this is the first attack, which begins the 50 days after the pre-trib escape, like right at the same time frame, and it ends about a week later, and here comes the son of man, for unto us a child is born, and it's his 40 days beginning, we know that it's either going to be directly connected that the 40 days will begin at his birthday, or until you realize that Matthew 4, that said this confirmed that Jesus fulfilled it in the is, was once John was put into prison, we know that historically that was about two months later, which means he didn't come on his birthday. He came two months after his birthday that this was fulfilled, which is directly in alignment to the fifth and the seventh month on the Hebrew calendar. So he's coming to shed his light. See, he's coming to bring light in the darkness. That's exactly what he's doing when he comes for 40 days because we know the light group is the mark group, is the group that's called the lost sheep of the house of Israel that he came to save. The, the in Christ spirit filled are already gone. So now he's coming to shed his light. They've missed their opportunity to go to the third heaven. They're going to be now going to paradise. And I think this is something I should mention because one of our brothers, Earl's, had, had always <clears throat> had a difficult time with it. And we kind of saw these things differently. But I'm not going to speak for him on this except to say that I believe we're seeing on the same track now because in the past and I had, I had gone back and forth on this i had wondered that why do those that go pre-trib go pre-trib we know that they have to be spirit filled in christ they're watching and praying right they seek the word they're loving they're repentant 
but what's the difference? Like, what, what about those who go to paradise? Those who go to paradise, all they have to do is proclaim Christ. Now, I don't think it's just quite as simple as just saying, I believe in this completely don't change anything and you just live for whatever. But if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is your savior, that he died on the cross and his death and his resurrection happened and you believe in him and that it happened. Well, how is he supposed to deny you? Right. You may not be really having a change of heart and a change of life completely, but that's the difference between those who are in Christ spirit filled. That's why in second Corinthians chapter 12, the first group is in Christ spirit filled. The second group that goes to paradise, Paul says, is kind of sort of like the first one. You see, but what does that do for everybody over the last 2000 years? That means people were going to two places over the last 2000 years, two good places outside of hell. That means those who were in Christ, spirit filled, walking with the Lord, doing all these things, seeking him, all of those that died. Like I've, I think of some of our dear brothers and sisters in this ministry over the last six years and a bit that have passed from our brother Todd, our, our sister Margaret, our sister Ellie, uh, our sister Maxine, uh, our brother Rich Herdedu, and and others that have passed. Where do you, Where do I think they are? I mean, it's a no brainer. They're in the third heaven waiting for us with everybody else. But where might somebody over the last 2000 years before the end begins? Where are all those over the last 2000 years that kind of essentially lived their life and believed, really believed in their heart that Jesus was their Lord and Savior, but never really lived accordingly, never really spent much time in Scripture? Where are they? Well, they would be in paradise. And you see, what happens here is that. When the end of days begins and the pre-trib group, those spirit-filled in Christ are taken pre-trib, the reason that these other guys, what we call the Mark group, the reason that their time is still remaining and they have to endure seals is, for one, because they won't have the rest of their lives to make an additional change. They can't become spirit-filled anymore. They can't, they can't reach the point of going to the third heaven. That time is over. They were already believing as paradise people. So if they had died, you know, this year or last year or 10, 20, 100 years ago, they would have gone to paradise. But because at the moment of the pre-trib escape, they weren't part of the third heaven group, spirit filled in Christ, their portion isn't until the end of seals. When it's paradise time. So that's why they're enduring still to the end of seals. That's the difference between these groups. Both of them go to the kingdom of God, but there's different places in the kingdom of God. There's the inner sanctuary of the kingdom of God, the inner portion. And then there's paradise where their mansions are and everything else. That's the difference between them. They both still go. As long as they don't turn. Right. If you if you denounce Christ and you go follow the Antichrist because because you're so down and out, you're so distressed during seals, you weren't part of the of the pre-trib group and you didn't understand it and you just believed in Jesus. And then tribulation comes. And the mark of the beast comes and you're so famished and you survived and you've had friends and family and kids die and you're and, and you've still got a couple kids and 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 they're starving to death. Are you going to take that mark? Are you going to take that mark so that you can feed your, your child that's about to die? Or are you going to trust in the Lord? You see, that is now what they would have to endure because their time isn't till paradise. And what about the Jews? Well, we, we saw from Luke 21. We know that this attack is coming on them. They're going to flee from the land. It's going to be destroyed. Jerusalem will be destroyed. They're going to flee from the land. And for seven years, the land will be vacant while the stuff against the church takes place. And then it will be the seven years for Matthew, for, for the house of Judah. And why? What is their portion during trumpets? Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is on the earth. 
It is when the 14 years is over, the Lord re has returned, has destroyed the enemies, has done the, the, the year as Noah from Matthew 24, and then it'll be the final Jubilee to start the 15th year and the beginning of the millennial reign. They will all come back from the wilderness that they were protected in from mid-trumpets, and they will all receive their portion of land. It's all in order, guys. Two places in the kingdom of God, and the third, the kingdom of heaven, which is on the earth for the Jews. All right? So we see <clears throat> the Son of Man here. It helped us to understand that he's coming for 40 days. Not only that, which we knew, but the time frame. Now we can even show the time frame of when he's coming for those 40 days. So we've gone into that. Yeah, there's another one, right? <clears throat> In Ezekiel chapter 21. This is another awesome one. Because when the Son of Man is coming as prophet at the 40 days, he's called what? Well, we know the Lord is called the Son of Man. <laughs> Excuse me, he's called the Son of Man. And Ezekiel in a prophetic typology, is called the Son of Man. And what do we see in 21? We see, Son of Man, set thy face toward Jerusalem, and drop thy word toward thy holy places, and prophesy against the land of Israel, and say to the land of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, and I draw forth my sword out of his sheath, and will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked. He goes on to keep saying, Therefore shall my sword go forth out of his sheath against all flesh from south to north. It's all the sword, the, the sheath. It's coming out of the sword. Verse 9, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord. Say a sword, a sword is sharpened and is and also furbished. It is sharpened to make a sore slaughter. And in verse 11, he tells you he's about to give it into the hands of the slayer. All of this, We've broken this down over the years and shown that it's the prophetic picture of the Son of Man in 40 days and him giving the warning that the sword is coming. All of these are the same time frame. All of them give us a prophetic picture to the Son of Man's 40 days. So now when we go to Revelation chapter 6, what period of time is it? It's the white horse rider. Many people have said, how can the son of man who's coming as prophet be coming for 40 days and be the white horse rider if he's the one opening the seals? Well, it says the lamb opened the first seal, right? Opened one of the seals. When the lamb opened one of the seals. So he had opened one of the seals. He opened the first seal. And what does he do? He's the one that goes out on the white horse. He's the one here for 40 days. This conquering and to conquer is in relation to prevailing, to, to getting this group ready. We've talked about this. Even the bow and the crown is connected to the 40 days and is connected in uh, Revelation, in the beginning of Revelation chapter 12. What's he telling them about? And how can we really prove this in a simple way? Well, everywhere we read, He's talking that the sword is about to be furbished. He's about to give the sword to the slayer that it'll kill people all over the place. He's going to slay all men, all everywhere. Well, when do you get this great sword being given when it's going to go throughout the earth? So happens it's the red, it's the second horse, which is the red horse. And what does it say? Um, power was given to him. That sat there on to take peace. Remember, at the end of 50 days, this is the 40 days of the Son of Man. There's not many days hence, which is three more days. The Holy Ghost anointing takes place in Acts 2.0, and peace is then taken from the earth. See, from the earth that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. Isn't that just what, isn't that exactly what he was talking about in Revelation 20, in uh, Ezekiel 21? In Luke 21, warning about it, they're about to be destroyed, and it begins at Jerusalem. So what is it? Neighbor against neighbor, people against people, kingdom against kingdom. If you go back to Luke's discourse, you can clearly see in Luke's discourse, as we mentioned earlier, 
that he said, but before all these, meaning this is the 40 days white horse rider before what? Before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. When you go to Mark's discourse that begins now the 14 years, that starts the, 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 the 14 years on, on day one, what do we see? No break in between. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. All of this stuff right here in verse 8 is the first two and a half years of seals, and it's called the beginnings. The beginnings of sorrow, the beginning of travail, the beginning of pain. It's the beginning of tribulation. It's the beginning, the commencement of the 14 years. Luke's came before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. He is the red horse, uh, sorry, the white horse rider. So hopefully that really helps you guys to, to see and to understand this first Messiah prophet. He is coming as Jonah to fulfill the 40 days, to warn of the great sword coming, to let Jerusalem know they're going to be compassed about and to flee. The Muslims claim they that he's coming as this guy called Dajjal to be the Antichrist. And we know most of the world will believe that he's the Antichrist because the church has taught that Antichrist comes first. The church will also be upset with all the pastors who hadn't prepared their people. They weren't really in Christ spirit filled. And now they'll have to endure till their portion, which will be paradise. All of this fulfills Messiah as prophet. Now this has brought us from the 40 days. And now seals breaks out. The, the, the red horse rider breaks out. Jerusalem is then attacked and destroyed, which is when you follow the story in Isaiah 9, it's what happens after the light affliction, which happens, starts the 50 days. The son of man is here unto us. A child is given. And then you, of course, have Syria with the Philistines. And this is the great affliction, the, the one that destroys Jerusalem. So now this begins the red horse rider and the tribulation time of seals. Who do we know now is here during the time of seals? Well, we know that the that the uh, um, Moses slash John the Baptist is, is here, right? We've explained how Moses is a prophetic picture of John the Baptist. We're, we'll touch on it again, where Moses couldn't take them over into the promised land, which we know happens at the great multitude rapture. And we know that John the Baptist is also a prophetic picture that when you go to Mark's discourse, it started in Luke when brethren and so forth will, will come against you and some of you put to death. When you go to Mark's discourse, it tells you that brother shall betray brother, father the son. Because during seals, this is where this betrayal, where Jesus says, I have come to divide. You think I have come to bring peace. No, I have come to bring division. So during the time of seals is where all this division is taking place. But before the end of seals happens, John the Baptist type, who is a Moses type, has to restore all people, right? Has to restore father to the son, mother to the daughter, and so forth. Which is exactly what you see in Mark chapter 9 that I mentioned earlier at the transfiguration of when the Lord comes after six years of seals as the picture of six days. And what you didn't get in Luke was the story of how Elijah must come first and he says he did come first. See, verily he must come first and restoreth all things. Because he says unto him that Elias indeed come. And they have done to him whatsoever they listed. Because in this prophetic picture of it being the end of the six years of seals, the Lord is coming in the prophetic picture on heavenly Mount Zion. And he's now getting this conversation. Well, where was Elijah? which means Elijah had to restore all things. So this has to be also a prophetic picture for the end of days. Because in Mark's discourse, it would be brother against father, 
or son against father, mother against daughter, and so forth, which means at some point they have to be restored. And it means that if, if Elijah, the John the Baptist, Elijah, Moses type came first, he must have been there during seals to restore them so that when the Lord comes at the great multitude rapture, that division was no longer there and he's restored them. You following? So we, and this is something we've talked on a lot. And in those videos, in the last one, we shared on it as well. Even they talk about the Moses being a John the Baptist type. And he clearly is. John the Baptist is beheaded. Right? He doesn't, he doesn't take part in, in going over. Moses dies, doesn't take part in bringing them over into the promised land. But Elijah, who John is also a type of, is taken up in a whirlwind. So we've got those that die in Christ. We've got those that make it in the rapture. And as, as a remnant worker type, you've got those who've put their necks on the line during the time of seals, who are the John types, who were the ones from Jesus with them for the 40 days. And you've got the ones who survived not having put their necks on the line, like Elijah. And look at what it says in Mark 9. Um, what things they had seen till the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Now, you know what you don't see here? You don't see the word again. You see? Pretty strange to add the word again, wouldn't it? This one doesn't say again. Do you know why? Because when Christ came the first time, Christ came for who? Let's see, where is it? Matthew 15, verse 24. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Who are the lost sheep of the house of Israel? Mark's group. Mark's group, the, the house of Israel that the Gentiles are grafted into, that's called the world. Those who are spirit-filled in Christ, he didn't come to save them. They were taken out pre-trib, so he doesn't need to come and save them. It's that because they were spirit-filled in Christ, they have no part in this. Because theirs is the third heaven. This group, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, this is also who he's coming to save still during the time of seals. These are the ones he's coming to shed his light on during the time of seals that the remnant worker group will share and shed that light on during the time of seals. So that when he comes at the end of seals, he's saving who? The lost sheep of the house of Israel in the great multitude rapture the dead and the alive. So this is why when you come to Mark, you got to remember when Christ came the first time, <clears throat> he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So who is this relating to? Till the son of man were risen again, uh, were risen from the dead. This is who he came to save the first time. This is a picture of him talking about the first time when he came. This is what happened. He saved them the first time. Right, save the whole world. But he came to do it for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Those that have the connection to light, not spirit and light. It's the Mark group. It's the group he was always coming to save. The spirit with Christ had the other group. This group is the light group. And this is when he is now coming to save them. John the Baptist clearly already having come, and as the Moses type, already having come as well. So now, when Jesus comes at this point on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth year of seals to, to fulfill this seventh year of seals being here, what is he doing and who is he? He's already fulfilled prophet. So let's see what else comes. So oh, now listen, you're, we're going to put you on the hot seat again because you've put us in kind of an interesting place. Mm -hmm. And that is... Again, earlier we talked about the fact that there were some some in the in the pre-Christian period that actually believed in four messiahs, right? Mm -hmm. You've argued that there are four messiah types, but in another sense, you're also claiming tribal affiliation. We're not just talking about types, but actual DNA yeah. to tribes. And so you look at the, you know, if you look at um, the introduction to Matthew, 
it's a Davidic genealogy. You look at the, uh, the, the introduction to Luke, it's a Davidic genealogy. And so <laughs> I love that one. I mentioned that to you guys earlier, right? You go to Luke, it's a Davidic genealogy. You go to Matthew, it's a Davidic genealogy. So if the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, the first will be last, the last will be first, and it's Luke, Mark, Matthew, and you have the Davidic gene genealogy at the beginning, you have the Davidic genealogy at the end, who's left? Mark. You have Mark. Who is Jesus coming to save during seals? Uh, at the end of seals and who is he doing this for during seals to wake them up because it's their final chance they're not going to get to live the rest of their lives they're going to have to make that decision in the time of seals that's it this is the group that he came to save the lost sheep of the house of israel this final group that he came to save at this time during seals and so when he comes at the end of the six years of seals He's coming to save the Mark group. Yet the Luke group starts with Davidic. The Matthew group ends with Davidic. And I'm going to prove it to you also with the Matthew one in a new piece that we hadn't seen before. We had never found this connection as far as I know. At least I hadn't. And why it is where it is. Which means when he comes, as we've shared in the previous video, when he's coming as Messiah ben Joseph, which is also to say Messiah Ephraim, who is his firstborn, which we've shared, if you recall, in the, even in the last video, but in other times before as well, in Jeremiah 31, when we know from the Septuagint, which was mind-blowing to read in the Septuagint, in verse 8 it says, Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coasts of the earth, uh, and with them, the blind and the lame, the woman with a child and her that travails together, a great company, which means a great multitude shall gather thither. In the Septuagint, in the original first translation, it tells you that it would be at Passover. Remember what we said about Rachel? Rachel is the spring wheat, the second one that then can come. When would it be to the spring wheat? It's 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 harvested in the fall, right? Late, late summer, early fall, which is the time when the Lord comes at the end of the sixth year of seals. But the great multitude rapture, they, it can't be observed until the second day of Passover, the second day of unleavened bread. And what does this say in the Septuagint? Passover. This is the great multitude rapture right here at Passover. Now, listen to what it says in 31 verse nine. They shall come with weeping and with supplications. Will I hear them? I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel. Listen to this. And Ephraim is my firstborn. I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. You see? When he comes at the end of seals for this great multitude rapture, he's coming to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel, including the Gentiles grafted in, because they're all blended together. Nobody knows who they are anymore, right? So they're all over the world. And he's coming to save them. This is the group of light that he was coming to shed his light on. This is the group going to paradise in the great multitude rapture. And the beginning of Luke and the end of Matthew have a connection to David. And yet, there is still an unfulfilled portion of a Messiah ben Joseph, or you can say Messiah Ephraim. Because what they then talked about here, of four Messiahs, prophet comes first, King David comes last. There's two in the middle. Those two as we know and will show, are the same one. High priest and sacrifice. So the question then, the obvious question, and maybe the, the, the elephant that's in the room, is how do you see that Jesus actually can physically be the Messiah, son of Joseph? How can Jesus receive the DNA of Joseph and of David? Well, if we're talking about patrilineal descent, it's impossible because you cannot descend from 
in a direct line from two separate fathers. But of course we know that Jesus is the son of God. He's begotten in, in Maryam by the Holy Spirit. And that means that he does not descend patrilineally from any of the patriarchs, but that through his mother, he can receive the DNA of Joseph and of David and of Aaron. And this is clear. I mean, the New Testament presents Mary as a descendant of David. It also, Luke makes it clear that she's also um, a descendant of Aaron. And there's a lot more evidence of that outside the New Testament, particularly the Evangelium of James, but even further, there's a lot more. But how can he be descended from Joseph? Well, I think we did speak about this in a previous episode, but let's just run through it again. Um, yeah, just to make it, make it clear, we're talking about Luke one thirty six, where Elisheva, where it says to Miriam that Elisheva, your relative, and Elisheva yeah, is a, from a priestly line. Yeah. Elisheva, your relative. Elizabeth, Elizabeth is a relative of Miriam. So yeah. that's uh, Luke one thirty six. Yeah. yeah, you see, but for Joseph, we know that Omri, who's king of the Northern Kingdom, he's he looks like he's a descendant of Joseph. It's not likely he would be king of the Northern Kingdom if he wasn't a descendant of Joseph. And so Omri, from the house of Joseph, begets Ahav, Ahab, and Ahab begets Atalia, and Atalia marries Jehoram of the house of David, and through their son Ahaziah, the seed of Joseph, enters into the line of David. And so Mary as a descendant of David is also a descendant of Joseph. You, you, I, I think we got to stop here and you need to realize you've just like, this is a mic drop moment. Mm. Do they say mic drop moment in Scotland? And I don't know what A mic say. drop moment, because I want you to. <laughs> a, a mic drop moment, right? Remember that one a long time ago until somebody else took it over too much. But you see, so now we know Scotland. There you go. So we can see this connection. And what is she saying? Through Mary, all of them are fulfilled. Well, doesn't that make sense? Because in Christ is where all of them are fulfilled. All of them are fulfilled. Okay, let's keep going. We've constant, you know, one of the objections constantly uh, to Jesus being the Messiah is the fact that his father, that his tribal identity comes through the father. And so how can Jesus be a true son of David because his father, right, according, you know, he was born of a virgin. His father is not from the house of David. And therefore, he can't be the Messiah because he's not from the house of David. And so the, the, the kind of the whole notion of a virgin birth has been used as sort of a refutation of, of Jesus's Davidic lineage. And what you're saying is that only through a matrilineal Messiah can all the promises of these a, a, a Messiah from the house of Joseph, a Messiah from the house of Aaron, a Messiah from the house of David, that it's almost like, a, how would you say, a, a, a paradox that can only be resolved. Through matrilineal descent. Yeah. Mic drop again. Like, I, I'm telling you, we could just <laughs> camp out here. This is mic drop. This <laughs> is huge. I just want to make it what Seth said simple. <laughs> See, all of it fulfilled only through matrilineal, which is through his mother. He will fulfill them all. Because many of the objections we get is, you say that Yeshua is the son of David according to Joseph, but Joseph wasn't his real father because he was born from the Holy Spirit. So how can he be the son of Joseph? And you're saying that's that's not the, the, the full picture. He receives the DNA of Joseph through his mother, but he receives the royal title through his father, Joseph, because he was first in line to the throne of David in his day. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we just need to stop here because... <laughs> that's exactly it. We're going to stop there for the for these guys. Because did you hear that? Not only... Jesus fulfills everything through his mother, through the DNA. So he is Messiah ben Joseph. He is Messiah ben David. He is high priest. And of course, he's prophet. But that's through his mother. Now, they'll say, well, through his father. I mean, that wasn't his DNA. So everything is already fulfilled through his mother. But then you go to his father, his quote unquote stepdad, Joseph, and he had the line through to. Did you hear that? Son of Joseph. And you're saying that's that's not the, the, the full picture. He receives the DNA of Joseph through his mother, but he receives the royal title through his father, Joseph, because he was first in line. You see, his father was first in line. So Joseph, his adopted father, was first in line. To the throne of David in his day. To the throne of David in his day. And it just so happened that his actual mother had the DNA. So now, what does this, what does this have to do with mid-seals? What does this have to do with with a portion yet to be fulfilled at his coming at the end of seals well if he's the son of joseph and priest and he still has to be the sacrifice well and it's a bull because messiah ben joseph hasn't been fulfilled because as we shared in these other videos from these guys is that all of it is referred to for the bull for the ox there has been no ox sacrifice. Only the doves for Christ's birth, only the lamb for his death and resurrection. And we know, as we've shared before, 
that in Numbers chapter 20, it was Moses and Aaron that struck the rock to get water out of it. They said, must we strike the rock? That's not what the father told them. The father told them, speak to the rock. And they claimed it like it was them that has to do it. And not only that, they end up hitting the rock twice. One was for Moses. And he doesn't get to cross over. And the other one was for Aaron yet to be fulfilled. Why? Aaron, of course, was the high priest. There has to be a greater high priest than Aaron. And people will tell you, well, this was already fulfilled in Christ. No, it was spiritually fulfilled in Christ. He has not actually fulfilled the, the, the uh, um, Melchizedek, priestly son of Joseph lineage line. It hasn't happened yet. So who is that line? Well, as you guys, many of you would know, Ephraim is the banner of the ox. Well, isn't that fitting? How many years have we been talking about the ox? That in the end of days, it will begin with the ox. Remember Aleph? Aleph, that's why we keep saying in the month of Taurus, when the sun is in Taurus, that the whole count begins. This is what we're talking about. It's all about the ox this time. It's all connected to Messiah ben Ephraim or, or Messiah ben Joseph, the son of Ephraim. And that's why Jeremiah told us that. And Ephraim is my firstborn. This hasn't yet been fulfilled. And again, so this will bring us back to Leviticus 1, as we shared before. It's the offering for Aaron's priestly line and his sons, which is the bull, the one that hasn't been fulfilled yet. Now, check this out. He was talking in there. Um, if, if you were to listen to more of it as well, he ends up talking about, check this out, about Acts chapter 7. Now, I'm going to share with you another thing in Acts chapter 7 before we get to this piece that he had casually talked about. And I want you to remember something very powerful. Where is Acts chapter 7? Acts chapter 7, brothers and sisters. Acts chapter 7 is related to the seventh year of seals. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the prophetic typology in these chapters to years where chapter 7 of Acts is connected to the seventh year of seals. Well, what have I been leading to? The end of six years of seals. The Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion. He's coming as what? He's coming as high priest, right? He's coming as high priest. Who dies towards the end of the six years of seals? John the Baptist. That's what we just saw in, in Mark chapter 9. John the Baptist did come. He did restore them. So they've been restored, yet during seals, we know they weren't because they were against each other. But by the end of the sixth year of seals, they're restored so that when the Lord comes as on heavenly Mount Zion, he's now coming to seal the 144,000 and to bring in the great multitude rapture. So who is he coming as? He's not coming as the John the Baptist Moses type because John the Baptist, the Moses type, they're dead. He's died. He can't bring them over, remember? It was Joshua who brought them over. You see? It was Christ who took it forward after John the Baptist. It's the, it's the, it's the Joshua Yeshua high priest connection. That's why in the spiritual sense, he did, of course, fulfill as the high priest, as Melchizedek. But in the actual physical of that which still needs to take place, he hasn't. And we can see this. Watch this. Let's go into Acts chapter 7, which equals the seventh year of seals, which is the Lord having come. And look at how it opens. Now, this isn't about Christ high priest, but look at how it opens. The very first verse exclaims a high priest. But now watch this. In Acts, oh, no, no, I don't want to start there. That's going to that's gonna be the, the extra goodies. 
We're going to go down to, where are you, Moses? So now we're going to go into the period of Moses. Do you think it's by chance that in Acts chapter 7, we start talking about Moses? Moses was that prophetic picture during seals as a John the Baptist type. And look at, listen to what it says. Acts 7, verse 34. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. And I have heard their groanings, and I am come down to deliver them. What did we call the rapture group? Plucked out, remember? Remember the seven days as years in, in, uh, in Genesis chapter 8? Plucked out? What's the great, what's the rapture called? Right? Harpazo, which means to pluck. Here he is, Acts chapter 7. Having seen the affliction of my people, he has now come down to deliver them, to pluck them out. Where? In the chapter to year of Acts chapter 7. Listen to this. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared unto him in the bush. He brought them out after he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness. What do we know about the wilderness, brothers and sisters? This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, to your brethren, like unto me, him shall you hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. What church in the wilderness? Well, we're talking about the time of seals coming to the end. And now we're talking about this being the end of the six years of seals. The Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion. It's the word plucked where he's seen their affliction and he's come to deliver them. What happened? Didn't he say, in the wilderness, when they, they, they were, he was bringing them out of the wilderness. Do you know that even in our ministry revealed book that we talk about, where we reveal the revelation of the seven churches, we talk about the seven churches in the prophetic typology of the was Old Testament, give or take 2,500 years, the about 2,000 years of the church ages is, and the is to come, which is 50 days and 14 years. So what played out over 2,500, 2,000 in all of it is a prophetic picture like Ecclesiastes 1.9. What was shall be, what is shall be. All of this over thousands of years will give us a prophetic play out over 14 years and 50 days. That's how crazy. That's why Mark and Matthew, I've said it before, at, at mid-Mark discourse-ish and mid-ish Matthew discourse, it says it'll be worse than it was at any time in history. And then you get to Matthews, and this will be worse and will never be this bad again. Than at any time since creation. That boggles my mind. Because he says worse than at any point in history since creation. That's the middle of Mark's discourse. Middish seals. And then to think Matthew says... This will be even worse. And then never again, worse like this ever, ever again. So what we're reading here is we know that he is saying now he's delivered them from those who went into the wilderness. Well, what is Pergamum and Thyatira? Pergamum is the time when Antichrist will get his power to continue for 42 months. It's Mark's discourse when they're the flee to the wilderness, flee to the mountains. This is the rest of the end of the sixth year of seals. It's a period of dark ages, a very dark period of time in the is to come where they're still in the wilderness. This is where they flee. This is where they're still in the wilderness until what? Until the end of the sixth years of seals. Until the Lord comes for the time of reformation and it's Israel's kings. Until the time when the Lord comes. So when we're seeing this, he's rescuing them from and delivering them from the wilderness. We're seeing this exact same timing 
in the prophetic picture of seals to the end of the six years. And now the Lord is delivering them out of the wilderness. Let's show you this picture for those who might be newer. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, we did a video on this. I think it was earlier this year, and it was so exciting to do because it's something we've touched on, but now we've been able to make it so incredibly clear in its prophetic typology because Deuteronomy takes you to the end of Moses, right? Moses dies. Moses goes to the end of Deuteronomy. Moses dies. So this is a prophetic picture of what? The end of six years of seals. Because he doesn't get to take them into the promised land. Who's the one that gets to take them into the promised land? Well, you go to chapter one of Joshua. Joshua is the one, <coughs> excuse me, who now takes the people over into the promised land. When do we know that Joshua does this? At the end of seals. At the end of seals, at the end of the sixth year of seals, Moses dies, John the Baptist type dies. We saw it in Mark 9. And Joshua Yeshua, the son of Nun, is the one who now will take them over. When? They, they passed over. So who is the one who crosses them over, which is a reference to Passover? Who is the one who brings them over? Joshua, whose name is also a type of Yeshua. What was Joshua, brothers and sisters? Joshua was, of course, the high priest and king, right? We know that he was high priest and king. We know the connection as we showed here. In fact, when you go into this in Mark chapter 9, listen to what Mark 9, 1 says. Remember what it said in Luke? Listen to what it says to these guys in Mark. Verily I say unto you, there be some, stand, the, some that, of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Totally different, right? Till they have seen. It's a past tense. Why? Because at the end of the six days or six years of seals, they will have seen this coming. They're going to see the Son of Man coming on heavenly Mount Zion. This is exactly what we're reading at the end of Revelation chapter 6. At the end of the sixth seal, which is the end of the six years, listen to what it says in verse six, uh, verse 16, 17. And said unto the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? This is the Lord coming. This is paradise coming. The Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. He is coming in the clouds. It is a direct correlation to what we read in Mark's discourse of Mark 13 of him coming in the clouds. There's your abomination of desolation when they flee to the wilderness, as we saw. It's the same picture. It's the same typology of, Matthew, uh, of Moses. Remember Moses? They had a portable temple covered in skin. So that means during seals, what's happening? The temple of God is still within people because it's still the time of the kingdom of God. It's still the time of the Gentiles till the end of seals. And what are we? We are portable flesh-covered temples. This is why the abomination of Mark is the time of the mark of the beast when they flee into the wilderness. It's the same prophetic picture of the was of Moses and the portable temple. Until what? The coming of the Son of Man. And when he comes, he's coming in, which means in the clouds, plural. This is what they're seeing coming at the end of six years of seals. At the end of that sixth seal, this is what they're seeing coming. And who is it? It's Joshua Yeshua coming as high priest of Messiah ben Joseph through Ephraim, his firstborn. He is coming as what? He is coming as 
the ox. He is coming as the bull, as the ox. So he has now fulfilled the prophet at the beginning in the 40 days. Now he is coming to fulfill Messiah ben Joseph as high priest who is the ox. And we know the ox is through Ephraim, which means he is coming now as Messiah ben Joseph, who is his firstborn Ephraim. This is who he's coming to fulfill. And we saw that in Acts chapter 7, a perfect chapter to year, again, is being fulfilled in him saying that Moses and what he had done and for them in the wilderness, now he's coming to deliver them from the wilderness out of Egypt. You see, delivers them out of Egypt and they went into the wilderness. Then he delivers them out of the wilderness and in the wilderness, now you see the word plucked and his prophetic picture is him now coming as joshua and when he comes as joshua guess what we go to the same chapters to years and look what happens when we go to zechariah chapter 6 that same picture like like uh, mark chapter 9 at the end of six years this is the prophetic picture at the end of that sixth year of seals what do we get in that picture for zachariah as we've shared many times recently we see on the head of joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest joshua yeshua is now become the high priest sorry i've got something that keeps jumping in my way oh well so now he's become high priest and we know, we shared this in the last one, that the one who is going to build the temple is Zerubbabel the branch, who is the one who lays the foundation during seals, but that's the only thing that gets built. He is of the tribe of David, okay? He is or of the house of David, but he's not the final King David that's coming at the end. And you'll see what I'm talking about. So the main focus here, is we know that Joshua Yeshua, who is the high priest, the high priest is above the Z Zerubbabel branch, who is going to rebuild the temple, but they're going to rule, is going to be of peace, is going to be between them both. And we know who these guys are. We saw in Zechariah 4, the two olive branches, the two olive trees, right? It's Zerubbabel and Joshua. And look at where we see Joshua in Zechariah chapter 3. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, stand among the angels of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand coming to resist him. You see? It's, it's definitely Joshua, Yeshua, Messiah. And when he comes and he is high priest and king, it's the end of the sixth seal, which is directly correlated in the chapters to years of Zechariah as well, where we see him. Now, with Zerubbabel and Joshua Yeshua being the high priest, we shared how Joshua, the high priest, is also what? He's a descendant of Joseph. He is a descendant of Joseph. Do you understand how it's the end of Moses and, and Joshua brings them over? We, we have Moses, who is a type of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was in a type of Elijah, but the one who didn't die type. And John, being like Moses, <coughs> was until Christ came. Here it is, until the end of six years of seals, until Christ comes. And when he comes, he's again fulfilling the Joshua type in, from the was in the is to come. And when he fulfills it, he's fulfilling it as Joshua, the high priest, who is a descendant of Joseph, because the high priest is the sacrifice coming as high priest and uh, uh, as high priest through the descendants of the Messiah Ben Joseph. But do you want me to prove to you who he's coming to save when he comes at the end of seals? Listen to this. It says Joshua is a descendant of, descendant of Joseph. 
and both lived 110 years. Listen to this. Samaritan tradition describes Joseph as eight feet tall and a king, ready for this, who sat on a throne and wore royal purple and wore royal purple. It doesn't get any more clear for those who have been in this ministry. It doesn't get any more clear because who did we say he was coming to save? He's coming to save first as Messiah ben Joseph, and then he is the sacrificial priest who is also Messiah ben Joseph through Joshua. Who is he coming to save and then rule as the king of Israel? Remember that? Remember that? When he comes and saves them, brings them then from the wilderness, when Moses' portion is done, it's Messiah ben Joseph who is Joshua who then comes to rule over them, who is the prophetic picture of Messiah at the end of six years of seals for that seventh year of seals and then into trumpets. And what is he? It's called the period of Israel's kings. And what was he claimed to be wearing but royal purple? Well, let me help the brothers and sisters out who didn't yet understand this that I shared earlier that you will begin to understand when you watch the intro videos. Luke's going to the cross, and look at what he's arrayed in. A radiant, gorgeous, white, beautiful robe. In Matthew, he's arrayed in a, where is it? He's arrayed in a scarlet robe. Scarlet is a tribulation color. And then we go to Mark. And in Mark's gospel, we see Jesus was arrayed in, you guessed it, brothers and sisters, was arrayed in purple. You guessed it, purple. And who was Joshua when he brings them into the promised land, becomes high priest king, Ruling and wearing purple. When does he do this? When he brings them out of the wilderness as Moses had them there. And now in the seventh year ruling, coming for the reformation was the typology in the is and the period of Israel's kings in the was Joshua. My goodness. I told you guys. It gets so wild when you could see these revelations. And that's why it's so important to start in the intro. It is a mind-blowing, short-circuiting, making stronger connections. Your eyes and your understanding and your heart is filled in a way it has never, ever understood before. It's awesome. It's absolutely incredible. And that's why, as we were saying, <coughs> it brings you to the Son of Man coming in the clouds at the end of seals. And now, when you saw him at, coming in the clouds at the end of the sixth year of seals, when you he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, what do we see? The hundred, the beginning of the seventh year, that first about half year, he's sealing the hundred and forty-four thousand. And then what do we get? The rapture of the great multitude. Moses couldn't take them over. Then you have a period of time where the 144,000 are being sealed. And remember that Ephraim is my firstborn and the great multitude rapture that is at Passover from Jeremiah chapter 31. You can see it's directly connected. And then we saw that Joshua, in relation to Joshua chapter 1, he's the one that what? Brings them over, right? They go over the Jordan. It's a prophetic picture. Many have, have taught on this to say it's a prophetic picture of going over at the time of Passover. That is exactly what is happening in Revelation chapter 7. It's about six months or so later 
That's why in in Mark <clears throat> chapter nine, it was a past tense because they saw this coming. They saw this happening at the end of the sixth year. They saw him coming on heavenly Mount Zion and everybody freaked out, but they did not know when they would go. They now been restored as Moses did. They now been restored as the John the Baptist did. But their time of the great multitude rapture of mid-trib in the midst of the seventh year doesn't happen until the time of Passover, which is about six months into the next year. Now, check this out in its timing. Let's go to Numbers 18. In Numbers chapter 18, this will be for those um, those who are who are understanding this 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 group of priestly line and Levitical line. I want you to see this. In Numbers 18, 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Aaron, Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. This is important, right? Will bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. Okay, that inner place. And thou and thy sons shall bear the iniquity of your priesthood. And thy brethren, also of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of thy father, bring thou with thee that they may be joined unto thee, which means the priestly priesthood line is Aaron and his household, and that your brethren also of the tribe of Levi, bring them also that they may be joined unto you and minister unto thee. But thou and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of witness. Listen to this. Um, verse, yeah, verse five, Numbers 18. And you shall keep char the charge of the sanctuary and the charge of the altar, that there be no more wrath any more upon the children of Israel. Like the end of seals, right? And I beheld, and I behold, and I, sorry, behold, I have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel to you that are given as a gift for the Lord. To you, they are given as a gift for the Lord to do the service of the temple of the congregation. Therefore, thou and thy sons, the priests, thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priest's office for everything of the altar and within the veil. What's this portion of within the veil, guys? Remember the, the, the pre-trib group. They're going into the third heaven. They're going into the inner portion. That's this group here. That's this remnant worker group, this priestly remaining group line. They're called the group that goes within the veil. And he has taken Levites from among the children of Israel. So it started with Aaron and his, and his sons. And then the Levites from among the children of Israel were added to their service as a gift from the Lord. Well, guess what? Isn't that exactly what we talk about? We know that that this during the time of seals, we know it is a priestly line. Those two on the road to Emmaus, the ones that are with the Lord for 40 days, those disciples that will then be anointed to work during seals. They're, they're the prophetic typology of the, of the John the Baptist, of the Elijah types that are Moses. And who was Moses, but who was with Moses, but Aaron and his sons. And what do we talk about when the end of seals, when the end of six years comes? We have told you that there's not enough workers. We get this from Luke chapter 10. That pray to the Lord of the harvest that he sends more workers. Because when it's time for the great multitude rapture, there's not enough workers to help bring in the great multitude rapture. So we have this priestly line in Numbers 18 being told to us that 
he has given to them a Levitical line from among the children of Israel who are to help them in the service of these things. Well, look what happens. It was the priestly line working during seals who then need help to bring in the great multitude rapture. And what have we explained about this in the past? That the 144,000 are sealed. And we know that Levi jumps in for Dan and Joseph, <coughs> excuse me, jumps in for Ephraim. I believe they're all a prophetic picture of the Levitical priesthood line that come from among them all. Because what are they going to do, guys? We've explained this over the years from Luke 10, that these are the 144,000. The reason they're sealed before the great multitude rapture is because they're going to assist the priestly line of people to bring in the great multitude rapture, which I believe this is now giving us more evidence that the 144,000 are the Levitical line. And then what do we see? Bang. The great multitude rapture. Those who were dead in Christ being raised and those with palms in their hands. Those who made it alive and those who are now there <laughs> who had died during seals. We can see it. And now what do we have? Now this, this portion has happened. And we have what? In chapter 7, related to 7, <clears throat> we of course have a greater than Aaron. It's now the time of a greater than Aaron to be here. And who is the time? <clears throat> excuse me. Who is the one that's greater than Aaron? Well, what if we go to another um, chapter to year, like we had mentioned earlier, and we go to Hebrews chapter 7, which is the same time frame. The exact same time frame connected as we were sharing in Acts 7, as we talked about with John chapter 14. We go to Hebrews chapter 7, and it's the story of the order of Melchizedek. Okay? We come down here, and we see in verse 11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need? Was there of another priest uh, that another priest should rise after the order, order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? You see, why would there be another priest, a, a greater priest needed if the law was good enough and it was fulfilled and these things were taken care of through Aaron? He says, verse 12, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also to, of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance to at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Remember, it started in Judah because he's David, and at the end it will be Judah. Just like the end of the beginning of Luke to the end of Matthew, it starts uh, uh, David, it will end David. And it says, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood, which means there was no priesthood being spoken of coming out of Judah, and yet our Lord is from Judah. And then he goes on to say, and yet it is far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest. But you see, but he can't be out of Judah. So where on earth is he going to come from? Because there is far more evidence, he says, of one after the similitude of Melchizedek. And there arises another priest who is made not after the law of the carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life testifieth, of course, being Melchizedek. And as I said, you go to these chapters to years and you go to Genesis. Oh, you mean Genesis is also connected 
to the same seventh year of seals. And we go to Genesis chapter 14, as I had mentioned earlier. And who do we see? But the very first mention of Melchizedek. You got it. Melchizedek. All connected again to the same prophetic timing of when he comes at the end of the sixth year of seals to fulfill that seventh year. Now being what? The greater high priest than Aaron. Well, all you got to do is follow the storyline that ended with Aaron and Moses at the end of Deuteronomy and a greater than Aaron who is a high priest from the Messiah Ben Joseph who is the one who then takes them over into the promised land. This Messiah Ben Joseph is the high priest Messiah. And this high priest Messiah, who is Messiah ben Joseph, down through Ephraim, who is represented by the ox, is also the one that must still be sacrificed for the priestly line that failed. It's incredible, guys. It is absolutely incredible. Now let's go back to Acts chapter 7 again. That prophetic picture of the seventh year of seals. We now just covered the Moses part. But now get ready to be able to silence the critics that even though we show 14 years everywhere. And we have also explained it many years ago, a f several years back. I explained it in the story of Joseph and the seven uh, uh, good years and the seven bad years. And most people just don't get it. Well, I'm going to build to the revelation, but mainly for those who understand the revelation of the chapters to years, the prophetic significance of these chapters to years. And just as I showed in Acts chapter 7, the connection being the end time frame of Moses and the Lord coming to deliver them. <coughs> I'm now going to show you the prophetic significance of, you guessed it, Joseph. Watch this. In Acts chapter 7, starting in verse 8. And he gave them the covenant of circumcision. Well, right off the bat, brothers and sisters, he gave them the covenant. And who's he talking to? Well, why is there a connection with the Lord and this giving of a covenant in Acts chapter 7. Well, what do we know happens in the latter portion of the seventh year of seals? I personally believe that it is directly connected to Genesis chapter 8 and the seventh seal. That the silence in heaven about the space of half an hour, I believe this is when the Lord has made a covenant with all nations. When he makes a covenant with all people, you see, the world thinks Antichrist is the one that's going to make this covenant at the beginning of the seven years. You see, because they only see seven years of tribulation. They've missed all of these other things that I've been talking about up to this point. But now we've got the Messiah Ben Joseph, who is the high priest type. He is the, the Melchizedek. And now we're going to see as he's ruling and reigning, he is the one who brings about the uh, um, the covenant with, with all people. And what happens is because people only see through the eyes of seven years because they're looking through Matthew, they think that it's the Antichrist who's going to make a covenant, then the temple is going to be built in the first three and a half years, then he's going to step into it to declare himself God. They've mixed and mashed it all together of everything they see in prophecy because they haven't understood the seven years and the different groups of who they're speaking to in their times. So they have no understanding that it is actually Messiah as high priest and king who is there with Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel is going to rebuild the temple while the city and the streets and the wall get rebuilt starting the first half of trumpets. That can only happen when the Lord himself 
who is now there as the Joshua Yeshua high priest, will make a covenant with the people. And the city and the streets and the temple get rebuilt. It doesn't get any more clear than simply going to Zechariah and seeing that Zechariah in Zerubbabel laid the foundation. Then you go to Zechariah 6, like the sixth year of seals, the end of it. And you see that Joshua, the high priest, is now going to be the high priest and king ruling with the branch who is Zerubbabel, who is going to complete rebuilding the temple or who is going to build the temple on the foundation that he laid in the midst of seals. And to be able to understand this, we can go to Zechariah chapter 11. And in Zach, well, actually, before we get to Zechariah 11, we'll get to it in a moment. Because what you have to understand is the, the, the timing of these things. And if you think that it's Antichrist that builds the temple and then goes into it, it doesn't make any sense. At no point was it the enemy who built the temple for the Lord. You see, it's going to be Zerubbabel and the Lord there. The Lord will be with the 144,000 who will be in the service, right, of of the priest who is no longer the Aaron lineage, but is the priest who is Messiah, the greater one than Aaron. Hello. And the 144,000 are there with them. So that is now, we're, we're now at the, the end of the seventh year of seals. We're going to see in a little bit where the Lord makes this covenant. And when he makes this covenant, we can show where it's confirmed in Scripture by the place where he also has to break it. And then we can show in Scripture where then he's going to renew it again. And you see the whole world of church thinks and the people of prophecy think it relates to the Antichrist. It doesn't. The only thing that relates to the Antichrist when Satan's cast down is when, uh, um, is when Antichrist is, comes back from the grave at mid-trumpets and steps in to declare himself when Satan's there and the false prophet Antichrist and declares himself God. That's the only part they got right. Unfortunately, it's not for 10 and a half years. And they've missed all the surrounding stuff of who builds it and then who actually renews the covenant in the final year. So we'll get to that in a moment because it's all connected to the priestly line. And when it's over, it's no longer the priestly line. It's no longer the Melchizedek. So watch this. So now, as I said, now we're going back into Acts chapter 7. And we're following the connection in Acts chapter 7 in relation to, in relation to um, uh, 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 Joseph. So this covenant, as I said, we'll touch on it more so as we go a little bit further in. But, you know, since we're there, let me show you in Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, we see, starting in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, which means there's going to be this declaration after Jerusalem is destroyed, right at the beginning of the 14 years, there's going to be a declaration for them to rebuild it. It has to be destroyed first. And it's going to be what? A commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. Weeks of years. Seven years of seals. It won't get built during the seven years of seals. Comma and three score and two weeks, which is about three and a half years. Two as years, 60 as weeks is about three years and two months. So we're saying about three and a half years. And what happens in those about three and a half years after the seven years of seals, the city and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So you have this rebuilding now taking place and it'll be after the seven years of seals. Who do we know is here at the end of seals and now when trumpets is about to begin, we know it's the high priest and king, right? We know that the Melchizedek, the priestly Joshua line is there, is the person is there as Messiah who is the priestly son of Joseph, Messiah. Right? Messiah ben Joseph. And who else is there? 
Zerubbabel. Because Zerubbabel is the one doing the rebuilding. And you'll see as we get to this later, in 927, it says, and he shall confirm a covenant with them for, with many for one week. What this is about is because when Messiah is cut off mid-trumpets, he breaks his covenant. He has to break the covenant because Satan's been cast down, the pit has been opened, and war breaks out against them. It's not until what? The end of 13 to start the 14th year that he confirms the covenant that he had made earlier. He reconfirms the covenant. You see, that's why it's called confirming. He's going to prevail and confirm and complete this covenant that he made at the start of trumpets. So this is why in Acts chapter 7, in relation to the Joseph story, you're seeing a mention with high priest. That's just a little side note. But now you're seeing a covenant and what it's connected to. So we see this connection to covenant there. Gave him a covenant. We go to Acts ch chapter 7, verse 9. And the patriarchs moved with envy, uh, uh, and the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, and God was with them, and delivered him out of all his afflictions, okay, tribulation, travail, okay, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh. Now listen to this. Where did he give him favor? In the sight of Pharaoh king of egypt brothers and sisters most people never catch this they say oh well of course we know it was there well then why don't you realize that the first seven weren't actually easy years he was in captivity in the land of his affliction so chapter seven chapter seven to us prophetically is a picture of this first seven years coming to an end. So those Joseph seven years coming to an end is what you're going to see. Okay, let's let's confirm this. Um, in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over all his house. So this is like the beginning of the seven years, right? The first seven years. So it starts with telling you the beginning. And then it's going to tell you that it's the end of it. Listen to this. Now there came a dearth over all the land of Egypt and in Canaan. Did you hear that? So what happened? Seven years, Joseph, the Lord saw him, right? And delivered him out of all of his afflictions. Delivered him out of tribulation, trouble, persecution. And if you remember the word tribulation and afflictions, this definition of the word that's used 45 times is never used in Luke. But it's used in Mark and it's used in Matthew. So it says, and delivered him out of all, his, all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh and governed over Egypt and his house. Now listen to this. When do the first seven years come to an end? Well, people will tell you that the first seven years, they were easy years. So that's the seven years they would say. That's like the seven years we're in now. And then you got your seven years of tribulation. No, because he was taken and he was in the land of his affliction. He was in the land of who? A Pharaoh. He was in the land of Pharaoh. And listen to what it says. In verse 11, now there came a dearth. So now those first seven years were over. And listen to this. Now there came a dearth. Okay. Now there's the scarcity of food over the land of Egypt and Canaan. And listen to this. Great affliction. When does the great affliction begin, brothers? Tribu trumpets. Listen to this. And our fathers found no sustenance. Verse 13. And the second time. Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him. So what are you seeing? He's now calling, like Revelation 7, he's now calling his brethren to him, all of his brethren to him, 
And you've got this connection now to the great multitude rapture. Let's go back. Because he explains it. So you had those first seven years, and now the next seven are about to begin. And look at what he does. He gathers them to him. And in verse 16 of Acts 7, it says, And were carried over to Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Amr, the father of Shechem. Okay, look at this word carried over. To carry over, to translate. So you've got this prophetic picture, even through his father, where he's bringing him over into this land. <coughs> Just like we had a picture of Moses and that rapture group. Now listen to this. We now know that the seven of what they call seven easy years, they're not. They were the seven years while he was in the land of his captivity. He was in the land of the Arabs while it was great for Arabs. Hello. And now what's about to begin is the great affliction. Now what's about to begin is the great affliction. But the great affliction as it begins, he is now brought what? He has now brought all of his brothers. All of his brothers. So you've got Revelation chapter 7 and you've got the great multitude rapture. And they've all come in. Now listen to what it says about his brothers and what happens now that the bad portion, even in the land of Egypt, you see, because now it's Egypt and Canaan. Listen to what happens next. Remember, now this is the seven years of trumpets in the prophetic typology. Let me prove it to you by him saying what ends up coming from it. Acts 7, 17. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had shown to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. So what's happening? They're growing and they're multiplying in the first half of trumpets, right? The city and the streets and everything's rebuilding. Okay. Never mind that it's Egypt. You know what I'm talking about in the prophetic typology. There he is, the Joseph type, the Joseph Messiah high priest, right? Messiah ben Joseph. So now what happens? It's a time of great affliction, <clears throat> but they're protected because they've been brought into the land where the Messiah ben Joseph typology is now there. And they grow and they multiply. Remember what it said in Psalms 110? When Christ comes to begin the end of seals, to begin trumpets, when he's going to what? When he's going to what? Rule in the midst of thine enemies. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay? This is when he comes to sit on the right hand of the, of the Father. We know it's directly connected to the end of Mark's gospel where we read that. And... We know that he's still ruling in the midst of his enemies. The whole tribulation isn't over. Now it's trumpets time. He will have made a covenant with all people at the end, very end of seals. And trumpets begins and the rapture has happened and he's gathered his people back. And they're come back into the land. We know this also from Zechariah chapter 8. Again, chapters to years. <clears throat> chapters to years so you go to Zechariah right here chapter 8 and what do we see the Lord and his holy mountain and people are going to call it the mountain of the Lord right the Lord of hosts the holy mountain and he tells them in verse 8 let your hands be strong you that hear in these days by these words by the mouth of the prophets which were in the days that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid that the temple might be built we know Zerubbabel laid it during the midst of seals for the is to come. And we know it's Zerubbabel who's going to re or who's going to be in charge of the rebuilding. And so the Lord's telling you, lay your hands, be strong, because now is the time to come to build it. He says, before these days, there's no man for hire or anything because of the affliction. For I set everyone against his neighbor. That was the red horse rider, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So we see 
at the beginning of trumpets, the temple is about to get rebuilt on the foundation that was laid during seals. So now when we go back into Acts, and we know that the high priest Joshua, Yeshua Messiah, is there. He's, it, it's the end of the period of the Moses typology with the John type, and he, he delivered them out of the wilderness. Then we got this covenant, and we got this prophetic picture of, of Joseph, right when the Lord is now coming and taking over as Messiah ben Joseph, as, as high priest Melchizedek Joshua from the Moses type and bringing his people into the land, bringing his brethren into the land and great affliction is about to begin, which is the time of trumpets because Jerusalem is going to be surrounded and protected while it's being rebuilt and so forth, right? Carries them over. Now listen to this. This will take us to mid trumpets. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, multiplied Egypt, Verse 18 of Acts 17. Listen to this. Till another king arose, which Joseph, uh, which knew not Joseph. Till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. Do you know what this is taking us to? This is taking us now. Here he was. The Lord was coming. He rescued them like the Moses portion, the, the John the Baptist type, and he he now rescues them from the wilderness. He is the high priest and king, which is the time of Israel's kings like Joshua, Yeshua. And then what happens? You get into Philadelphia, which was the first half of trumpets. They were going out and preaching and doing their thing with the high priest and king, right? And the city and the streets were being rebuilt. And then what do you see? The period of Israel's removal. And at mid-trumpets, Messiah is cut off like we read in Daniel and the Laodicean age begins the second half of trumpets. And it's called the period of Judah's kings, but it's the time of the apostasy. Who comes at this point? Who is it at this point? Acts 17, 8. They're telling you that now what's going to happen because they're giving you the entire story in Acts chapter 7 when he comes as the Messiah ben Joseph to take over as the greater priest than, than the Moses Aaron lineage that was there before that he took him out of the wilderness. And now he's telling you that they're going to be in the land. They're going to prosper. They're going to grow in the land until another king arises that doesn't know Joseph. And listen to what it says in verse 19. The same dwelt uh, uh, dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. They may not live. Now listen to this. Subtly with. So he dealt subtly with. Does this sound familiar? To be crafty against. Who is crafty, brothers and sisters? Who is the crafty one? You guessed it. It's the Antichrist and, and, you know, Satan, when Satan is cast down, when does this happen? About three and a half years into trumpets. So the first three and a half years, jo uh, Messiah ben Joseph, who is the high priest, who is the ox of the firstborn, who is Ephraim, has about three and a half years while the city and the streets are being rebuilt, even in the midst of being uh, uh, of their enemies because the world isn't still all in favor. Everything's still happening. You're still having the first four trumpets take place around the earth. Until what? Until the high priest Melchizedek, Joshua Messiah, gets cut off. When the crafty one, when the pit is open, this is why now we go to Zechariah 11, and you're going to see this now in the order and why it's important, is because now... When this craftiness one comes, it's the time when Messiah is going to be cut off. And we see this down here. In Zechariah verse 10, uh, verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 10. Remember, one year, two years, three years. So in the 11th year or in the 11th chapter, you're still in the fourth year, right? You're in the fourth year, but it's what? about three and a half years. It's three years complete. You're in the fourth year, which is chapter 11. 
And it says in verse 10, and I took my staff beauty and cut it asunder. Listen to this, that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all people. And it was broken in that day. Wild, right? The only way the Lord can break this covenant is he had to have made a covenant with all these people first. When does he do that? You guessed it. In the seventh year, which is why it said the covenant that he made, he makes it at the end of the seventh year of seals, which I believe is the seventh seal, when all of everything is settled down and the great multitude has come in. And now he makes a covenant with all nations. And that's why when you get to Zechariah chapter 8, the seven years of trumpets have begun, and it starts with the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple, which is precisely why you're seeing this in relation to what it said in Daniel. In Daniel chapter 9, you're now seeing the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple, and it takes place during the about three and a half years, including what? The wall, the wall. And when those about three and a half years are done, look at what it says. Messiah is cut off, but not for himself, but for the people of the prince that shall come and destroy and with a flood unto the end of the war. This period from the cutoff is two and a half years. We've shared it in many, in many places, but very clear ones in a couple. But you see, when it starts, what's happening? For the first about three and a half years, as he is what? As he is the Joseph, Yeshua, Messiah, high priest and king. What is he? He's connected to Joseph, right? All of it is showing us this connection to Joseph. And where do you see the wall? Right there. When they start rebuilding the wall. And what do we see? What's Joseph connected to? Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a well whose branches run over the wall whose branches run over the wall so he's a fruitful bow his branches run over the wall we know the connection to it when they start rebuilding the city and the streets is now when he's here when he's made the covenant and what happens well john 15 same place when the rebuilding starts what is he he's a fruitful bow right right here in John 15, after the great multitude rapture taken to the paradise place in 14, we see that he's the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. So who are the ones that have to be bearing fruit here or he's going to remove them? They're the 144,000. They're that Levitical priestly line that now the high priest uh, um, Melchizedek type is taking over from the one that wasn't enough, you could say, through Aaron in that priestly line. He's now taking over, and the 144,000 are in service to him. That's what the that's what trumpets is about. And we know that during the first half of trumpets, them being fruitful is because they're to go and evangelize. Right? That's that's exactly what happens. Look at what happens in relation to Philadelphia, right? In the is, they were the great missionaries, right? In the typology of it during the time of, of revival and so forth. This was the time of missionaries going out like crazy. Well, that's exactly what it relates to when trumpets, the seven years of trumpets begins. They're the, they're the fruit. They have to go and be fr fruitful. And check this out. We know that they relate, that Philadelphia are the evangelists. Well, check this out. We go to Acts in the prophetic typology in the chapters to years. Watch this. John, or sorry, Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. So you've got 28 chapters in Acts. You have a prophetic picture in 14 and in 14 chapters, two ways. So let's go see what happens in Acts chapter 21. They're going to go find Paul. Uh, uh, sorry, they're going to go find uh, Philip, right? Well, listen to this. In Acts chapter 21, verse 8. Remember, this is the seventh year of seals. And what happens first? The 144,000 get sealed before the great multitude rapture. So here it is in a chapter to year. Let's see if we see a prophetic picture of evangelists getting sealed. In verse eight, and the next day, 
uh, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea and entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven. What? Which was what? One of the seven. One of the seven what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What was he? One of the seven. Where do we see it? In the prophetic picture of the seventh year. Do you see how powerful it is? Once you really get a grasp of these chapters to years in the timeline and the differences and the, the timing of the people, it's absolutely incredible. All right? So now we're, we're understanding this period of time that we're in. We're seeing where it is. Let's now go look at Genesis uh, chapter 41 and finish this piece in relation to Joseph. I want people to grasp what it says. Not only, I mean, it's hard to point to people and say, well, look, it's here in chapters to years. There's a reason why it's in Acts chapter 7. No, that's for the diligent, those who the Lord is opening the understanding and they can come in and seek it and search it out. But when you go to Genesis now 41, just listen to what it says. Where did I have it? Let me go to my highlights. Where are you? Genesis 41. We see that there was seven years, seven plenty years, right? Seven plenteous years. And he gathered up all the food, seven years, which were in the land of Egypt. Joseph gathered the corn of the sea and so forth. Uh, and unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine. Okay. Before the years of famine. So these two sons were born while he was still in Egypt. And to Joseph, he called the first one Manasseh. And the name of the second one, he called Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful. Where? Where was he fruitful? In the land of his affliction, guys. Those seven first years to which these children were born in those seven years. It happened in the land of his affliction. You see, just like in the seven years of seals, do you think it's going to be the land of affliction where, where the Muslims are and where they're being prosperous and where things are going for them? Of course, that's where it's going to be good for them. It's going to be a good time. It's going to be their time. It's going to be their, them thinking it's their victorious time. And what happens when the seven years, the first seven of the 14 begin? When the 14 years start, who's destroyed? Jerusalem. And when Jerusalem is destroyed and they flee to the mountains before it gets destroyed and then they're still fleeing. Do you know many will be killed, of course, as Luke 21 says, but also many will be taken captive. During their captivity, where do you think they're going to be for seven years? In the land of their affliction, brothers and sisters. In the land of their affliction. You see, people don't get that. They read through these things, but they just don't quite catch it. It's not seven easy years and then seven hard years. Those first seven, he was a captive in the land of his affliction. Oh, sure, he did great in it. And doing well in it, he prospered in it. That's not the story for everybody. They'll be taken captive. Many will be killed. He was in the land of his affliction, which were Arabs, right? Egyptians. It's the same prophetic picture. Because during the seven first seven years of seals, it's going to be prosperous for the Arabs slash Muslims in particular. That's what's going on. That's the picture that we're seeing. And so, again, we now see this, this time frame where we, we've come to this seals time. Joseph now typology shows up, the greater than Aaron, the Melchizedek. He is the, 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 the Messiah, Ben Joseph, who is also priest. That's where these guys mixed it, right? They, or they didn't get it. So we've covered now that he was 
he was prophet, and that's during the 40 days. Then he's coming as Messiah, Ben Joseph, and priest in one. And so how does he become the Messiah priest who is the sacrifice? So they had the, the Messiah, Ben Joseph, who is priest, and they had the sacrifice separate in thinking it was already fulfilled completely, not realizing that in the end, all four of them will be fulfilled. So uh, prophet, then we had, so prophet was up here during the 40 days of the 50. Then we had him coming at the end of six years of seals. He's now come as Messiah Ben Joseph, as high priest, as the Melchizedek. But as this high priest greater than Aaron now taking over, and bringing them over into the promised land, he's now about to be cut off at mid-trumpets. And when he's cut off at mid-trumpets, which we know is connected to Zechariah chapter 11, this is when, not the sacrifice, but this is when it all begins, when it, when it starts to turn, because this crafty one who has come, which is the one who comes, when the pit is opened and Satan is cast down, and he's going to go into the temple that was rebuilt, and he's going to declare himself God. It's the timing they were telling us of when the crafty one would then come in, in the later years in the typology of, jo of, of uh, Joseph. So now look at what we see. We go into Zechariah, and in Zechariah chapter 11, we see where Messiah where the Ben Joseph Messiah, high priest, has to now break his covenant. Which means, obviously, as I had said earlier, he had to have made a covenant with all people first. We know that he did it at the start, very end of seals, to the start of trumpets, and then all the rebuilding took place, even in the midst, while tribulation is still, great tribulation is taking place around the world. Okay? Now the pit is open. Ten and a half years, the pit is open. Messiah is cut off. How long is Messiah cut off for? Well, let me show you. It starts in Zechariah 11, and it lasts for two and a half years, as you guys know. Why is Zechariah 11 also important? Well, we're in the seven, seven years, which are now Matthew, Judah's time. We're in the seven years of trumpets. And look at what happens when he breaks his covenant. There's how many chapters? There's essentially two right 12 and 13 and a half so you've got half of revelation uh, uh zechariah 11 12 and 13 and then at 14 he returns feet down on the mount of olives you see this is why when you go to daniel chapter uh 9 verse 27 when he confirms that covenant in that final year it's him renewing the covenant that he broke in mid trumpets so when messiah is cut off look what happens it's two and a half years and it's He's weighed here 30 pieces of silver. They throw him into the house and so forth, right? They throw the pieces of silver into the house of the Lord. They weighed for him 30 pieces of silver. Do you know when you go into the story of the money paid for Jesus in Luke, it only says the money. Do you know when you go to it in Mark, it only says the money. Do you know what happens when you go to it in Matthew? Let me show you. Only, and see, this is again the differences in the Gospels. It is important to understand they are prophetic insights. Only in Matthew's Gospel do we get 30 pieces of silver. Only in Matthew does it give us the precise definition 30 pieces of silver and not just simply money isn't that wild Zechariah 11 had the same thing these things are prophetic this is the reason they are spoken of the way they are is prophecy even the example here or the reasoning here that you have two and a half chapters from when Messiah cuts cuts his cut breaks his covenant you have half a chapter one, two, you have two and a half chapters. And what do they represent? They represent two and a half years. Well, in the is of what happened to Christ, remember all this? I was telling you the days can be years, years as days and so forth. 
we've shown many, many examples of that. Well, look at what happens in in uh, um, this story. In the truth of what happened when Christ was here the first time, he never was in the grave three days and three nights. It was impossible because in 14, 15 different passages, it says, and he rose the third day. It didn't begin from when he was put in the grave. We've shown that from Luke, we can show that it was from when he was taken into the hands of sinful men that the count began. So he was taken into the hand into the hands of sinful men on the 14th, right after the meal, right? They went up to, to pray in the mountain, taken into the hands of sinful men. That began the count. Then he was uh, put in prison. He was beat on, so forth, uh, whipped. He was taken to, to uh, on the 15th, right? The following day after the Passover evening. He's then taken. Uh, he's crucified. He's buried before sunset. And then he's in the tomb. And then resurrection on the 16th, early in the morning. The entire thing from taken into the hands till resurrection was only two and a half days. He never fulfilled the, the, the three days and three nights yet. But did you hear what I said? It, the whole story was two and a half days. What is the picture in the end of days? From the time he's cut off to the end of the sixth year of trumpets is two and a half years. Right. It was about two and a half days with Messiah, and it's about two and a half years in the end of days. And we could prove it in this incredible chapters to years chart by showing the time frame that remains within them. And that when this cutoff happens in Zechariah 11, it was the 30 pieces of silver, and it had to be during the time of trumpets because only Matthew mentions which is trumpets time is the prophetic time when the 30 pieces of silver would be given an actual definition it's incredible it's so so wild now where else do we know that it's um two and a half years well for those that are newer to the ministry and don't know this in daniel chapter 12 um daniel's like oh my goodness how long how long oh lord how long will it last and he says that it will be in Daniel uh, 12, verse 7, halfway through, it shall be for a time, times, and a half. There's no and between a time, times in Daniel 12, verse 7, which means one, two, plus a half. So it's like if I put like this number, one, two, three, four, I'm not adding them. There's no and. It's just simply four. If then I then said and a half, it would be one, two, three, four, plus a half. But if I said one and two and three and four and a half, you would be one plus two is three, plus three is six, plus four is 10, plus a half. It would be 10 and a half years. Okay, that's how it works. There's no end here, which means one, two, and a half for a total of two and a half years. You can show this understanding by going to Revelation chapter 12 and show where when they fly away on the wings of an eagle to a place protected, which is the same beginning as Daniel 12, 7. When that time times and a half begins, it's the same beginning of when they fly into the wilderness. It starts the exact same time of time and times and half a time. This one is an addition. So you've got one plus two plus a half, which means Revelation 12, 14 is three and a half years. That th These three and a half years will take them all the way to the end of the 14th year. But we know the craziness that they're talking about in Daniel chapter, not, uh, ja Daniel chapter 12 is how long is Satan's time going to last? How long when the pit is open and the beast comes back and they go in and the, this war breaks out? How long is all of this going to last till it's over? And we're told two and a half years. How do you know it also? Because in uh, Revelation chapter 10, it says when the seventh trumpet begins to sound, the mystery is over. Which means 
when it begins, there's a group taken on the wings of an eagle till the end of the 14th year. And then there are those who remain during these two and a half years, and they will have war against the beast and Satan and so forth. And that war will last two and a half years. And then what happens? Well, you have the prophetic picture of Christ that was about two and a half days. And we have this prophetic picture of it now being two and a half years. But what do we know Joshua Yeshua is? <clears throat> According to scripture, the two olive branches. Zerubbabel and Joshua are the two anointed ones and rule between the two of them. The high priest Joshua Messiah is the higher one who's directly connected to the father and Zerubbabel is overseeing the rebuilding. If they're there and they're the ones cut off that the war breaks out against, if we go to Zechariah, uh, Revelation chapter 11, we go to the end of the sixth trumpet, which is the end of the 13 years of tribulation, which is the end of the two and a half years that Satan had when the pit was open, who dies? The war that breaks out against them when the pit is open is going to last two and a half years like you saw in Daniel. How long is it going to last? It's going to last two and a half years. That war is going to be against the two witnesses for two and a half years at the cutoff at mid-trumpets. And then what happens? They're killed. And their bodies, right? They're dead for three days and a half. Well, isn't that interesting? Because at the end of the two and a half years, which were a prophetic picture of Christ two and a half days, at the end of it, right near the end with days to go, it says that those two witnesses one who said it's Zerubbabel and the other one who is Joshua, the high priest, who is who is Messiah ben Joseph, who is the firstborn from Ephraim, who is the bull who hasn't yet been sacrificed from, uh, from uh, uh, Leviticus chapter one. That still has to be sacrificed, who has to be the atoning for the, the Levitical priesthood line. Because something of them that they do or have done. That sacrifice, that atonement for them hasn't happened. Hence, him being one of the two witnesses, just like Zechariah tells us. And it's why in Matthew, Jesus has not yet fulfilled. Where is it? The story of Jonah. Jonah has not yet been fulfilled by Christ. When he said three days and three nights in the heart of the earth as Jonah was in the belly of the whale. Do you get it? What do you think three days and three nights is? It means that on the fourth day after three days and after three nights on the fourth day sometime on the day of the fourth which is what? Three and a half days. They stand up. And they go to heaven. Brothers and sisters, this is the end of the 13th year of tribulation. It is the end of the two and a half years from when the pit was opened to the end of the 13th year. This brings to a conclusion. The, the atoning sacrifice of the ox that Joseph as the Messiah ben Joseph through Ephraim as as the Joshua high priest and sacrifice as the Melchizedek still had to take place, who had to take over for Aaron, that, that wasn't good enough, that still had to physically take place, is all going to happen in the end of days as prophet, as Messiah ben Joseph, the high priest, the sacrifice and atonement, for that priestly Levitical line. There are now three of them. That these guys were looking in the understanding. To, to be fulfilled. The prophet. Messiah ben Joseph. The high priest. 
and sacrifice, which is all in one, to then what? To then the final 14th year. What did we see in this final 14th year? Well, we saw from Revelation 12, 14, that a group of people is still kept away for that final year until it's all over. But we saw in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, that we have Messiah, he that shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Who's the one confirming this covenant? Of course, it is Messiah returning feet down on the Mount of Olives to confirm that covenant that he had made at the very end of seals to start trumpets that he cut off at mid trumpets because of the two and a half years with the with the pit open. Now, after his death and resurrection for the sacrifice of the bull, which had to be through Joseph's line. He now returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, confirms that covenant. And in Zechariah chapter 14, what do you see? There he is returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. Who is he when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives? Who do you think he's now going to fulfill? Well, let's have a quick listen to this one. Just the first few seconds. There is, in rabbinic literature, a figure called Messiah ben Yosef, the Messiah son of Joseph. This Messiah comes from Galilee to die, pierced by ruthless foes at the gate of Jerusalem. Upon his death, Israel are scattered amidst the nations, but his death confounds Satan, atones for sin, and abolishes death itself. And then he is raised to life again. What do you think about this quote, Golan? This is amazing. <laughs> See, these guys are like, uh, what do we do with this, right? And is raised to life. The guy even said, again. He even said, again. Who is he? Who is he? When he returns feet down, brothers and sisters, he is no longer Messiah ben Joseph. He has completed the fulfillment by the sacrificial ox as the high priest king as, as Joseph. What now needs to complete the end of days is Judah. And what happens when he returns as Judah? Remember, this is still all got to be connected to the trumpets, to Matthew's portion. And it says, like we shared last time, Matthew uh, uh, Genesis 49.10. The sepulcher shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, until Messiah come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Bind the fowl unto the vine, and, comma, and, meaning another one, and the ass's colt unto a choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. We showed you in the last video how, again, only in Matthew's gospel, in the triumphal entry, do you get the story where you have an ass and a colt? In Mark's, it's one. In Luke's, it's one. Why only in Matthew's is an ass and a colt? Because Jesus does not fulfill this in the prophetic understanding of it until he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. And when he comes as the Mount of Olives, remember what we said? Luke. It starts as, as David, Matthew, it ends as David, and all the stuff in the middle he had to complete to fulfill as Joseph, Messiah ben Joseph. And as Messiah ben Joseph, Joshua himself was wearing a purple robe, a purple garment, right when he comes to save those from the purple. Now... We are now at the end of trumpets. We're at the seventh year of trumpets. Satan is now, the, he had his two and a half years and the pit opened and the beast there and everything else. Now the Lord, in the final year, he's coming for the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. And he's coming what? He's coming with an ass and a colt. What, what did it tell us in Judah? In, in, in Genesis 49, that Judah was the one connected to the ass and the colt. And what do we know this time is connected to? Again, connected to what it said about Judah has to be that it's when he's coming as David the king. When he's coming to rule and reign as king. 
during the millennial reign, at the end of that 13 years, to, to destroy the enemies and then bring everybody back at the end of that final 14th year, and the millennial reign will begin. And look at what we see. Here he is, Revelation 19. He's coming to make war against them as many crowns and his clothes and was clothed with a vestiture dipped in blood. His sharp sword, and it's the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. This is when he now returns as Messiah ben David. He is returning as the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, all uppercase. Brothers and sisters, let me show this to you in a way that you will now see it and be confirmed like never before. In fact, I'm going to start by going into Luke. Remember what I said about the triumphal entries? They're all a prophetic picture of pre, mid, and post. And what that means is when he comes for his 40 days in Luke, it's when he comes after six years in seals, and when he comes after the sixth year of trumpets, which means when he's coming at that final year is Matthew's, all right? So let's go to the triumphal entry. We've showed how, you see, it's just a cult. And we've talked about how this is the Lord coming during the 40 days. There he was warning Jerusalem like he said he would as the prophet. We covered that. But remember what I said about verse 38 in Luke 19, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Okay? Let's go to what Mark says now. In Mark's triumphal entry... Where is Mark's triumphal entry? Uh, I'm having a brain fart. I think it's 11. Yeah. Mark chapter 11, triumphal entry. Again, just the cult. And then we go down and we read. Uh, we talked about the branches cut down. It's so awesome. So many incredible things. And look at what it says. Uh, Mark 11 verse 9. And they that went before and they that followed crying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Okay, Hosanna in the name of the Lord. Now look what happens when we go to Matthew. You want to see this prophetic picture confirmed and revealed? In Matthew chapter 21, the triumphal entry, which is the prophetic picture of him returning feet down to fulfill the final year. Listen to what it says. There's the ass and the colt, just like it had to be for Judah. Because it's through now David as Messiah ben David when he returns feet down and destroys these enemies and then will gather them back. Here he is, ass and colt. He was, you know, dipped in blood. All of that stuff that we saw from uh, Genesis 49. Are you ready for this? Listen to this. Here it comes. Matthew 21 verse 9. And the multitudes that went before and followed cried saying, here it comes. Hosanna to the son of David. Yeah, baby. There it is. Another prophetic understanding being revealed in why certain things are said in some gospels and not the others. They are a prophetic understanding to the revelation of the end of days. We've said it for so long. We've got old videos in that intro video series. You will see how the triumphal entry, the transfiguration, and the resurrections give us prophetic pictures of him coming for 40 days, him coming at the end of six years of seals, and him coming at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, which is the beginning of the 14th year of trumpets. And we know in between he must be as Messiah ben Joseph. And when he completes and fulfills the Messiah ben Joseph as the sacrificial ox high priest, he will then return feet down as Messiah Ben David to fulfill and complete the son of David when he comes with the ass and the colt and with his vestiture dipped in blood. Brothers and sisters, man, these are the types of things I just, it, I, I love going through them. It blows my mind. And this is why now, if you go to Matthew 17, and I'll finish up with these. Remember the transfiguration is in Matthew is the prophetic picture after the 13th year of tribulation or after the sixth year of trumpets. And look at what it says, as I shared with you earlier. Only 
Luke's didn't say anything. Mark said that when he would rise from the dead, that's because he fulfilled Mark's one for the world already. But the Matthew one, that priestly line, that ox sacrifice that still hasn't been fulfilled, he needs to fulfill it. And this is why he warns them ahead of time. He says, and as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them saying, tell the vision to no man until the son of man be risen again from the dead. Do you understand there's no need for the word again? They could have simply repeated what it said in Mark until he be risen from the dead. Why does it have risen again from the dead? Remember what he said here in this opening clip? That there was this fulfillment of a, of a Messiah Ben Joseph type and that he would rise, uh, that he would die again. The guy who wrote the book doesn't even realize or at least isn't telling the world if he does, and I don't think he does because he's written a lot of things on it. He doesn't even realize that it is the ox and the death of the ox and the Lord rising again and returning feet down from Messiah Ben Joseph to fulfill the final portion of Messiah Ben David, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. To fulfill what? Prophet Messiah Ben Joseph, priestly sacrifice, and Messiah Ben David, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Remember what I said about how in the beginning here, how John's gospel, it's like it, it, it does this replay. It starts here with 20 and then goes, which is connected to the 50 days. And it gives us that eighth day to the 40 days in Luke and then all of that playing in the 50. Well, it's also, as we showed, the prophetic picture in typologies in the end of days within it. And when you get to chapter 20, what is chapter 20? It's the same as, as what he's telling them in Matthew 17, that he has to what? That he has to rise again from the dead. Rise again from the dead. And we saw in Mark that it didn't need to use the word again. So what do you think when we wrap this back around? It starts with the 50 days in the typology of John 20. And what do you think happens when it wraps all the way around like a circle back to John chapter 20? Do you know what it says? Let me show you and we'll finish with this. John chapter 20 is like the prophetic picture of the very end of the sixth trumpet. The end of the 13 years, and just as the 14th year is about to start, this is what we get for the prophetic picture. Listen to what he tells them. John 20, verse 9. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They knew not that he must rise again from the dead. Why? Does Matthew and why does John 20 use the terminology, use the wording for again in the places where it's used when in each case it's the final year prophetically of trumpets? It's incredible, guys. You know, is it hard for people? I mean, this is the type of thing. We don't just go and tell people, ah, the Lord's going to die again. Did you know the Lord's going to die again? And, and we tell them just because we want to tell them something we know that they don't. No, that is difficult, man. Unless you want them to think you're, you're a loony. Unless you want them to think you're in some sort of cult. You know, of course they're going to think you're bananas. They don't understand the Gospels. They don't understand the 14 years. They don't understand the differences in the Gospels, who they're talking to, their timing, the prophetic picture we've done from Genesis to the end of Revelation over and over and over again. There's no way we can go to people and say, oh, yeah, Jesus is going to die again. You're either going to get punched in the face. You're going to get kicked out of church. You're going to you're going to be a, 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 a leper in your family. Don't start there. Start with the revelation of the differences in the Gospels to show them these differences of who they're speaking to. Then show them that from those differences, that means that the discourses are different and it must be speaking to different portions of time. And you lead them then to show them 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and the, and, and the, and the picture that Paul shows 
that the first group is in Christ and they go to the third heaven. And then he says that the second group isn't really like the first group. Well, how is Paul telling himself about himself being in Christ and then not being in Christ and that they go to that they go to the paradise? And then you read down and it says in the third time, I'm coming to you. It's a pre, a mid, a post. And then you can go into those differences in the discourses and show those differences over the 14 years and change. But definitely, this is why I say if anybody was somebody new today watching this and came across this video, turn it off and, and go start with the beginning. And for anybody that's been a part of the ministry that has been understanding and has been tracking and following these revelations and you still haven't watched this video, it was important to go and watch this one first to understand how much more clarity we were able to connect in this portion of tribulation and what the Lord still had to fulfill. We now know with the certainty, absolute certainty, that he must fulfill Messiah ben Joseph, and it is the line through Ephraim, who is the bull, which is something we have been revealed through the Holy Ghost over three and a half years ago. The one confirmation through the Holy Ghost that all of this this time is connected to the bull, and it begins it and ends it with the bull, and then the Lord will return feet down, having fulfilled Messiah ben Joseph, and will now return as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, destroying all the enemies, bringing them all back, fulfilling his Messiah ben David, all four Messiah types fulfilled, not only in Christ, as they were in Mary through to Christ, but in Christ fulfilling them all four in the end of days as well. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you as it has me. It 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 just I, I can't believe it. It is so incredible to understand all of these things, to be able to piece them together. So take your time, watch it again, study it. There's so much detail in these. You can study them. This could be somebody's thesis for the next four years to go through. It is so jam-packed, it is so powerful, and it is true. He is going to do it again. But it is for love. It is for purpose. And even though it's difficult to accept for many, when you understand his purpose and his love in these things, it will all make sense. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.